The House will come to order. Prayer by the chaplain. Good afternoon, my name is Justin Grimm, and I want to say quickly thank you to Representative Kelly Moeller, my wonderful rep who made this honor possible. Also thanks to Gail Romanowski for all her work in this arrangement. Let us pray. Holy God, who shows yourself to us today as you do every day, in the warm sunshine outside our windows, in the promise of spring, in the going out of the ice, in the calling of the birds as they return, in the swirling smoke from the sugar houses, and in everyone we meet, we come before you in need of clarity and illumination. For who among us can see all things? Who among us knows all things? Who among us has been everywhere and seen all there is to see? Flooded with options, confused by possibilities, and limited by our own experiences, we have become like broken compasses, pointing here and there, aimless and wandering wanting to do what is right, desiring to do what is most needed, we ask at this time, on this day, for ears to hear, for eyes to see, for minds to discern, and for energy enough to do all that is asked of us. And God, we ask for voices too, voices with volume enough to be heard, voices with courage enough for justice, voices that are as humble as they are convicted. Thank you, God, for we know you are here. Lead us and guide us and empower us. Amen. Amen. The chaplain for today is Reverend Justin A. Grimm, the director of Evangelical Mission and assistant to the Bishop for the Next Generation Ministries, St. Paul Area Synod, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Pledge of Allegiance. Please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Members, when the chief clerk calls the roll today to establish a quorum, please state your name, your location, and that you are present. Members using the remote voting application should also press the green yay button when your name is called. The clerk will take the roll. <clears throat> Akam. Akam Minnetonka, present. Akam Minnetonka, present. Agbaje. Agbaje, Minneapolis, present. Agbaje, Minneapolis, present. Ackland. Ackland, St. Paul, present. Ackland, St. Paul, present. Albright. Albright, Prior Lake, present. Albright, Prior Lake, present. Anderson. Anderson, Barsness Township, present. Anderson, Barsness Township, present. Backer. Backer, Browns Valley, present. Backer, Browns Valley, present. Bonner. Bonner, Maple Grove, present. Bonner, Maple Grove, present. Barr. Barr, East Bethel, present. Barr, East Bethel, present. Baker. Baker. Becker Finn. Becker Finn, Roseville, present. Becker Finn, Roseville, present. Bennett. Bennett, Albert Lee, present. Bennett, Albert Lee, present. Berg. Berg, Burnsville, present. Berg, Burnsville, present. Bernardi. Bernardi. Beerman. Beerman, Apple Valley, present. Beerman, Apple Valley, present. Bliss. Bliss. Bernardi, New Brighton, present. Bo. Bo Chaska present. Bo Chaska present. Bolden. Bolden, Rochester present. Bolden, Rochester present. Burkle. Burkle, Skagen Township present. Burkle, Skagen Township present. Carlson. Carlson, St. Paul present. Christensen. Christensen, Stillwater present. Christensen, Stillwater present. Daniels. Daniels, St. Paul present. Daniels, St. Paul present. Doubt. Doubt. Davids. 
Davids Fillmore County present. Davids Fillmore County present. Daphne. Daphne St. Paul present. Daphne St. Paul present. Damoth. Damoth Cold Spring present. Damoth Cold Spring present. Detmer. Detmer Forest Lake present. Detmer Forest Lake present. Draskowski. Draskowski Winona present. Draskowski Winona present. Eklund. Eklund St. Paul present. Eklund St. Paul present. Edelson. Edelson Edina present. Edelson Edina present. Elkins. Elkins St. Paul present. Elkins St. Paul present. Erickson. Erickson St. Paul present. Erickson St. Paul present. Feist. Feist St. Paul present. Feist St. Paul present. Fisher. Fisher St. Paul present. Fisher St. Paul present. Frankie. Frankie St. Paul Park present. Frankie St. Paul Park present. Franzen. Franzen St. Paul present. Franz and St. Paul present. Frazier. Frazier, New Hope present. Frazier, New Hope present. Frederick. Frederick, St. Paul present. Freiburg. Freiburg, New Hope present. Freiburg, New Hope present. Garofalo. Garofalo, St. Paul present. Gomez. Gomez, Minneapolis present. Gomez, Minneapolis present. Green. Green, Faustin present. Green, Faustin present. Greenman. Greenman St. Paul present. Greenman St. Paul present. Grossel. Grossel, Clearbrook present. Grossel, Clearbrook present. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, Glencoe present. Grunhagen, Glencoe present. Haley. Haley St. Paul present. Hamilton. Hamilton St. Paul present. Hamilton St. Paul present. Hanson R. Hanson R. St. Paul present. Hanson R. St. Paul present. Hanson J. Hanson J. Burnsville present. Hanson J. Burnsville present. Hassan. Hassan Minneapolis present. Hassan Minneapolis present. Houseman. Houseman St. Paul present. Houseman St. Paul present. Heinrich. Heinrich St. Paul present. 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 Heinzman. Heinzman, St. Paul present. Heinzman, St. Paul present. Her. Her, St. Paul present. Hertos. Hertos from Greenfield present. Hertos, Greenfield present. Hollins. Hollins, St. Paul present. Hollins, St. Paul present. Hornstein. Hornstein, Minneapolis present. Hornstein, Minneapolis present. Howard. Howard, Richfield present. Howard, Richfield present. Hewitt. Hewitt Rosemont present. Hewitt Rosemont present. Igo. Igo St. Paul present. Johnson. St. Paul present. Johnson St. Paul present. Jordan. Jordan St. Paul present. Jordan St. Paul present. Jurgens. Jurgens St. Paul present. Jurgens St. Paul present. Keeler. Keeler St. Paul present. Keel. Keel. Hammond Township present. Keel, Hammond Township present. Cleavorn. Cleavorn, Plymouth present. Cleavorn, Plymouth present. Cagle. Cagle, Spring Lake Park present. Cagle, Spring Lake Park present. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, St. Paul present. Kosnick. Kosnick, St. Paul present. Kosnick, St. Paul present. Creeshaw. Creeshaw, Little Falls present. Creeshaw, Little Falls present. Lee. Lee, St. Paul present. Lee, St. Paul present. Liebling. Liebling, Rochester present. Liebling, Rochester present. Lily. Lily, St. Paul present. Lippert. Lippert, Northfield present. Lippert, Northfield present. Lislegard. Lislegard, St. Paul present. Lislegard, St. Paul present. Long. Long, St. Paul present. Long, St. Paul present. Lucero. Lucero, Wright County, present. Lucero, Wright County, present. Lewick. Lewick, Aiken, present. Lewick, Aiken, present. Mariani. Mariani, St. Paul, present. Mariani, St. Paul, present. Markwart. Markwart, St. Paul, present. Markwart, St. Paul, present. Mason. Mason, Egan, present. Mason, Egan, present. McDonald. McDonald, Delano, present. McDonald, Delano, present. Mecklen. Mecklen Becker Township present. Mecklen Becker Township present. Miller. Miller St. Paul present. Moeller. Moeller Shoreview present. Moeller Shoreview present. Moran. 
Moran, St. Paul, present. Moran, St. Paul, present. Morrison. Morrison, Deep Haven, present. Morrison, Deep Haven, present. Mortensen. Mortensen, St. Paul. Mortensen, St. Paul, present. Mueller. Mueller, St. Paul, present. Munson. Munson, Lincoln Township, present. Munson, Lincoln Township, present. Murphy. Murphy, St. Louis County, present. Murphy, St. Louis County, present. Nash. Nash, Waconia, present. Nash, Waconia, present. Nelson M. Nelson M, Brooklyn Park, present. Nelson M, Brooklyn Park, present. Nelson N. Nelson and St. Paul present. Nelson and St. Paul present. New Brindley. New Brindley, St. Paul present. Noor. Noor. Noor, Minneapolis present. Noor, Minneapolis present. Novotny. Novotny, St. Paul present. Novotny, St. Paul present. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll, Sartell present. O'Driscoll, Sartell present. Olson B. Olson B, St. Paul present. Olson B, St. Paul present. Olson L. Olson L, Duluth present. Olson L, Duluth present. O'Neill. O'Neill, Maple Lake present. O'Neill, Maple Lake present. Pulowski. Pulowski, Winona present. Pulowski, Winona present. Petersburg. Petersburg, Wasika present. Petersburg, Wasika present. Far. Far, St. Paul present. Far, St. Paul present. Pearson. Pearson, Rochester Township, present. Pearson, Rochester Township, present. Pinto. Pinto, St. Paul, present. Pinto, St. Paul, present. Poston. Poston, Lakeshore, present. Poston, Lakeshore, present. Pryor. Pryor, Minnetonka, present. Pryor, Minnetonka, present. Quam. Quam, Byron, present. Quam, Byron, present. Raleigh. Raleigh, St. Paul, present. Raleigh, St. Paul, present. Rasmussen. Rasmussen, St. Paul, present. Rasmussen, St. Paul, present. Ryer. Ryer Egan, present. Ryer Egan, present. Richardson. Richardson, Mendota Heights, present. Richardson, Mendota Heights, present. Robbins. Robbins, St. Paul, present. Sandell. Sandell, Woodbury, present. Sandell, Woodbury, present. Sandstead. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Sandstead, Hibbing, present. Schumacher. Schumacher, St. Paul, present. Schumacher, St. Paul, present. Schultz. Schultz, Duluth, present. Schultz, Duluth, present. Scott. Scott, Andover, present. Scott, Andover, present. Stevenson. Stevenson, St. Paul, present. Stevenson, St. Paul, present. Sundin. Sundin, St. Paul, present. Sundin, St. Paul, present. Swazinski. Swazinski, Nordland Township, present. Swazinski, Nordland Township, present. Tice. Tice. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Tice, St. Cloud, present. Thompson. Thompson, St. Paul, present. Thompson, St. Paul, present. Torkelson. Torkelson, St. Paul, present. Torkelson, St. Paul, present. Erdahl. Erdahl, St. Paul, present. Erdahl, St. Paul, present. Vang. Vang, Brooklyn Center, present. Vang, Brooklyn Center, present. Waslowick. Waslowick, St. Paul, present. Waslowick, St. Paul, present. West. West Blaine, present. West Blaine, present. Winkler. Winkler, St. Paul, present. Wagamot. Wagamot, St. Paul, present. Zhang J, excused. Zhang T. Zhang T, Maplewood, present. Zhang T, Maplewood, present. Joachim. Joachim St. Paul present. Joachim St. Paul present. Speaker Hartman. Speaker Hartman St. Paul present. Doubt. Doubt present. Baker. Baker Wilmer present. Baker Wilmer present. Bernardi. Bernardi. Present, New Brighton. Bernardi, New Brighton, present. Bliss. Bliss.
The clerk will close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. <clears throat> journal of the House, 92nd Session, 2021, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wednesday, March 17th, 2021. If there is no objection, further reading of the journal will be dispensed with and the journal will be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. <clears throat> Hearing no objection, the journal is approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Reports of standing committees and divisions. A copy of this order of business is online. If there is no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. Second reading of House Files. Second reading House File 10. Second reading. Second reading House File 586. Second reading. Second reading House File 592. Second reading. Second reading House File 762. Second reading. Second reading House File 782. Second reading. Second reading House File 964. Second reading. Second reading House File 1064. Second reading. Second reading House File 1915. Second reading. And second reading House File 1950. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. <clears throat> introduction of first reading of House files 2302 through 2325. First reading, House Files 2302 through 2325. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Garofalo moves that the rule therein be suspended and an urgency be declared and that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that House File number 2307 be given its second, third readings and be placed upon its final passage. The member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo, to your motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, members, recently the Federal Congress passed a bill which had many provisions in it, spent a lot of money. One of the things that was in there is that they said in the year 2020, tax year 2020, the first $10,200 of unemployment income would be excluded from federal taxation. This is a no-brainer. Every Democrat in Congress voted for it. Uh, there are other reasons why some people voted against it, but this is the federal law. This is what has happened right now. So now in Minnesota, we have an opportunity to make sure that those who were unemployed last year no longer have to pay in higher taxes or get the tax relief they need right now. Uh, would the Majority Leader yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Majority Leader Winkler, uh, I, f I assume you're familiar with this provision. This uh, bill is 100% targeted at those who lost their jobs last year. 100% of the tax relief goes to people who lost their job last year. How about we suspend the rules today? We don't have any big speeches. We'll take it up. We'll pass this bill. There'll be no amendments from the Republican side of the aisle. If the Senate screws around with it, we'll side with you and blast the Senate. What do you say? Let's make a deal. The member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Represent Winkler. Madam Speaker, Representative Garofalo, we will make a deal on unemployment insurance as fast as we can. The Tax Committee is reviewing these provisions. We have t budget targets coming out on Tuesday of next week. We know that unemployment insurance uh, is definitely something that we want to do. We look forward to working with you as quickly as we possibly can to get a bill done that fits within the, the rest of the financial framework of our budget. And uh, Representative Garofalo, I really admire your newfound appreciation for people who are unemployed. Representative Garofalo. Well, Madam Speaker, it's a sad day in Minnesota. It's a sad day in Minnesota. And Madam Speaker, first of all, I would request a roll call on my amendment, or my motion. Representative Garofalo requests a roll call. There's 15 hands. Are there 15 hands? Yeah. A lot of members in the chamber today. There are 15 hands, Representative Garofalo. There Thank will you. be a roll call. Madam Speaker, I'm actually gonna win one today. That's a good one. All right, so Madam Speaker and members, again, this is the unemployment insurance side of this. We need to pass this separately. Waiting for the end of session train wreck, leadership tribunal decides everything, monster omnibus tax bill, that doesn't work for the unemployed in the state of Minnesota. What this bill does is it gets it done, it gets it out of the way. Every member of this chamber is in favor of this provision. Every single one, there's no organized opposition to it. It's $269 million dedicated tax relief to those who lost their job. Let's prioritize this, let's show them we can do this. Let's prove to the public we can actually get along and get something done. Madam Speaker and members, I ask for your support. The member from Clay, Representative Marquardt. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker and members. And rest assured, uh, the Tax Committee and the House will be conforming 
uh, to the unemployment insurance benefits that uh, those who lost their jobs uh, received. And um, it's been a big priority. And in fact, uh, I know Representative Garofalo's bill was introduced today. Uh, Representative Stevenson's bill was introduced three weeks ago uh, on this topic. And we heard this in committee nine days ago. It's a top, top priority. And members, it's important, but we don't have to pass this today. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service announced <clears throat> yesterday that they're going to be uh, moving the filing deadline to May 17th, which happens to be an interesting day here in the state legislature. Uh, so uh, that is gonna provide us to put together uh, a tax bill uh, or more that not only provides benefits for folks who lost their jobs, but also for uh, families and workers and small businesses. A bill that will come before the tax committee, will be before the house, and folks will have an opportunity uh, to support our unemployed workers and our families and our small businesses impacted by COVID-19. And that's gonna be out way before, way before any May 17th deadline. And, and Madam Speaker, uh, we know that hundreds of families, hundreds of thousands of families around the state uh, and workers uh, were unemployed. In fact, when you look at the unemployment insurance at the peak in April, there were 500,000 claims. Now, even in January, there's about 133,000 uh, claims. And so uh, we have to make sure that these families and these workers who lost their jobs and some jobs that may not come back uh, that they don't get this unexpected uh, tax uh, on their bill. So uh, members, uh, this is going to be taken care of. We are going to do that. And I am hoping that mem all members of the tax committee and all members of the house at that time when we put together not only a bill that will conform at least to what we have here, the federal um, subtraction of $10,200, but also when we provide relief, tax cuts, and benefits to every single family and worker and small business that's been impacted uh, by COVID-19. So uh, members, um, we don't need to do this today. It's very important. We're going to get this done. Let's do it right. So I would ask members to please uh, oppose the Garofalo motion to suspend the the member from Washington, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Chair Marquardt uh, yield for a question? I will, Madam Speaker. He will, Representative Jurgens. Uh, Representative Marquardt, you mentioned that the uh, federal government extended the filing deadline to May 17th. How does that impact the state of Minnesota filing? Does the state, is it automatically extended in the state or does the state need to uh, also conform to that? Representative Marquardt. Madam Speaker and uh, Representative Jurgens, uh, yes, the Department of Revenue still has to do that. Um, we will find that out by the end of the week. Uh, in almost every instance, in fact, I don't know when that has not occurred, uh, the Department of Revenue has just followed the deadline extensions of the federal government. So I would have strong, strong, strong presumption that the Department of Revenue will also go to the May 17th uh, filing deadline. Representative Jurgens. Uh, so for clarification, that's not something that we need to address legislatively. Representative Marquardt. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Jurgens, that is correct. Thank you. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just heard that uh, the chair said, I have strong, strong, strong presumption that X, Y, Z will happen. Well, you know what? I had a strong, strong, strong presumption that Governor Walls would follow the Constitution, but I was wrong. So we could be wrong in this presumption. And we know what presumptions do. They make uh, something out of you and me, right? And so we shouldn't presume. And here we have an opportunity to actually take action as a legislative body and not rely on the, the executive branch to do the work that we should be doing. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, would the tax chair yield for a question? Representative Mark Hoare, will you yield to a question? Madam Speaker, I will yield. He will yield. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Chair Mark Hoare. So can you help me uh, recollect what is your understanding when tax law changes, how long it takes to disseminate those changes out to the various tax softwares to for the, the Minnesota Department of Revenue to update their forms, et cetera. Representative Marquardt. Madam, Madam Speaker and Representative Lucero. Um, so from what I have received from the Department of Revenue, uh, what they would do is let's say we made a change today, uh, depending on how major it was and so forth. But if it was a major change of any sort, they would probably have to stop at least receiving any electronic filings for at least two weeks, takes them about two weeks, and also with the vendors and so forth. So, um, you know, minimum probably of two weeks, if it is really major and you're getting right up close to deadlines, it may end up winding up having to do amended returns. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and would the tax chair yield for another question? Madam Chair, uh, Madam Speaker, I will. He will, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Marquardt. So if it takes a minimum of two weeks, and if today is March 18th, and people have to file then by the new federal deadline, and if we assume that the Minnesota Department of Revenue will also extend, then that means approximately the first part of May is when uh, we would have to, to uh, pass any tax changes in order for them to disseminate. And that's if it's a minor change, and I don't know if this would be considered a minor or major change, uh, but I presume that there will be other changes, as you had mentioned, that will be putting into effect. So this won't be the only change. So when you combine with the additional changes that uh, would be going forward to conform, those in their totality would be considered a major change. So I think we should expect that it'll be more than two weeks to disseminate the, the changes that we pass as a legislative body. So that being the case, uh, we have, uh, if we were to pass it right now, there are only a handful of weeks. So can you guarantee, Madam Speaker and Representative Marquardt, that the foot dragging that we've continued to see from the Democrat majority will stop and we can actually get this passed prior to the, the date where uh, it would have to be uh, it, uh, pushed out successfully and disseminated, thereby not requiring hardworking Minnesota taxpayers to have to file amended returns? Representative Marquardt. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Lucero. Uh, in speaking to the tax committee, we have been well ahead of things, heard bills way ahead of anything ever introduced uh, from the other side of the aisle, quite frankly. Uh, and we've actually heard all of these uh, bills. It all depends on the Department of Revenue. Uh, if it's things moving forward, they wait till after, uh, after the legislature's done and they fix things and so forth. So it's, it's tough to say. Uh, they could do things very much towards uh, the end, if need be. The fact of the matter is, the deadline day now is May 17th. It's May 17th, which means we can do the due diligence now. We're going to have a tax bill or more uh, out way before even April 15th. We're going to have it out uh, the first week of April. And I'm, I'm anticipating uh, to have member support as we move this through. But I think it's very important that before we leave people behind, which have been kind of all the proposals, we only kind of pick and choose certain people when we've had an entire state impacted by COVID-19. Um, I think it's vastly important that every small business that has been hit hard by the COVID-19 gets aid, every family and worker. We need to rebuild. We not only need to recover and respond, we need to rebuild and have a stronger state afterwards. That doesn't happen overnight while we're dealing with a COVID-19. So uh, I think the tax committee in the House uh, has moved with due diligence in looking at these issues very thoroughly and efficiently. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I am among the many Minnesotans across this state that do not have the confidence that the Democrat majority will actually pass bills on time early enough for them to be able to take advantage of filing tax returns 
without having to file an amended return. As we saw the wanton disregard by the Democrat majority blowing past the March 15th deadline for businesses, a wanton disregard, I fully anticipate that the Democrat majority will continue to drag their feet and blow past with wanton disregard uh, the individual tax deadline. Because passing in early May uh, is going to blow past the filing deadline of May 17th because it will not be able to be pushed out in time. So I highly encourage members to vote green on this motion. Thank you. The member from Wabasha, Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With the taxpayer tax chair yield again. Please. Representative Marquardt, both a taxpayer and a tax chair. Will you yield? Uh, Madam Speaker, yes, I will. He will yield. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative uh, Chair Marquardt, I, I may have missed, you may have covered this earlier, but uh, can you tell us mechanically how the executive branch obtained the uh, legislative authority to change the date? Representative Marquardt. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Skowski, no, I don't know for sure. I just know, you know, like during COVID uh, last year, they're able to do that. I guess um, you'd have to ask someone else as to the, um, what's the source of that. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm gonna look into that. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I don't trust this administration, the way they've been operating and the, uh, unbelievable amount of power that they have been usurping uh, beyond that that has been legislatively uh, handed to them. And uh, I think we need to be on the lookout uh, for that and not simply trust uh, what a commissioner tells us. And let's make sure they have the authority to do it to begin with. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Mr. Chair. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this is exactly what people hate, absolutely hate about the legislature. We have something we all agree on and we still don't pass it and people are just mystified. Not taxing PPP, not taxing unemployment benefits. It's something widely supported, but it's gonna get pushed to the end of session and it's gonna try and be negotiated with and it's an absolute terrible way to run a government and a state. And it's <laughs> just depressing to see it happened. And this is exactly why people hate the legislature. You know, Congress has horrible approval ratings. I'm sure our approval ratings are hardly better. So I'd encourage uh, the Democrat majority to, to take action on this because we do agree. And it's not like this is going to happen instantly if we pass it today. We still have time to work on it and get it right. But the pe we need, people need to know what's going on with their taxes. They're in rough shape and they need to know that this giant tax liability isn't going to be there. Because even though we all agree, there are plenty of things we all agree about that don't get passed. Just look how long it took to get Sunday sales passed. Sunday sales, something that had like a 75% approval rating among the public, took years to pass the legislature. So let's not treat this like Sunday sales. Let's actually work together as the people intended when they elected a majority that was as slim as the one you have now. So. This is a perfect time to do what Minnesotans want, to do what Democrats want, and to do what Republicans want. So rather than political posturing, let's just vote green and get this moving so we can get people the help they need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I've been talking to several folks. And um, one of the things that I keep hearing is, is when state government has this type of surplus and we're taxing um, PPP and we're taxing all the COVA dollars, uh, just like Representative West is saying, people are frustrated. Um, they want to be able to move on. I, I mean, I respect you, um, Chair, uh, what you're trying to do, but there are times that we just have to get things done. This makes sense. Minnesotans want it. Um, they know how to use their money better than state government. We've seen that with all the fraud waste. It's This is the right time to do it, members. And um, I would ask for a green vote also. Thank you. Any further discussion before the maker of the motion closes? 
The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, again, um, this is a week uh, of action where House Republicans are stepping up and bringing bills forward to do the things that Minnesotans expect us to do here in the legislature. And this is just the latest uh, version of that. Yesterday, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, the SAFE Act. Uh, earlier in the week, we did the uh, exemption of the PPP loans from, from tax. Uh, from state tax, uh, and tomorrow, uh, today we'll do this one and, and the summer school bill, um, as we promised earlier in the week. Uh, we think we think that commitment to Minnesotans is important. We think they expect us to come to St. Paul and do things, uh, and frankly, we chose these things because we know that they're all broadly bipartisan um, and and broadly uh, uh, important and all very very timely. Um, interestingly enough, on this particular provision. Um, on making sure that Minnesotans don't have to pay state income tax on the supplement to the unemployment insurance. This one is incredibly timely. I actually got a text from my tax preparer today who said, hey, Kurt, sorry to bother you. Um, I, I'm sitting on about 100 returns that I can't file um, because we're waiting to find out if you're going to do this. And I said, yes, I think it's coming, but unfortunately, uh, we can't get the Democrats in the House to move on it. So, um, you know, my hope is it'll happen before the end of the session. And then also today, the governor came out with his supplemental budget where he has exactly this provision in it, right? So, I mean, this is not some partisan, you know, and, and, and I don't think it's necessary to hold this up and just my one single tax preparer in, in Little Elk River, Minnesota, um, who's sitting on 100 returns, multiply that times the thousands of tax preparers across the state, who are telling their, their, their customers right now, you can't file your, your tax returns because this, if you do, you're going to have to pay in. And remember that a lot of those people would get huge refunds back. So now the state of Minnesota is sitting on their money. So I'll explain it for those of you who can't quite follow along with the basic English here. Normally, those people would be getting a refund. But because of this provision, they're going to have to pay in a huge tax bill. I'm going I'm to do a dramatic pause here so that can sink in, so you can realize what you're about to vote no on. Hope that was long enough. I guess we'll see when the board opens up. So, you know, I heard some other things here, you know, that the Democrats introduced a bill to do this three weeks ago. Well, they didn't, because that bill doesn't do this. That bill does a similar thing, but that bill creates a whole bunch of unintended consequences. But I, but I think it's also important to note that that bill is another symptom or another example of Democrats in the Minnesota House not doing anything this session. If you introduced it three weeks ago and you know that you're affecting the, the lives and livelihoods of Minnesotans and you haven't brought it here to the House floor to pass it, and somehow that's our fault, at, at, I was hoping that we'd get to like the second or third bill this week and we'd have like a little wake-up call and I thought this one might be the one. Especially when I saw the governor put this provision out in his budget today, that this is what the governor is proposing. And here we are asking you to do it as well. We also heard about how this isn't important because the feds have, have pushed the date out to May 17th, which has zero to do with anything we're talking about today. You know why? Because the feds aren't taxing these dollars. We are. And by the way, our tax returns are still due on April 15th. So thank you for making my point for me. This is absolutely timely, and we need to do it now. And I also just want to make a commitment to you because I think your word has to be worth something around here, so I want to be on the record because I've heard a couple of times Democrats in the House say, well, we have to, we have to hold this back because we want to do some other tax cuts for some other people and make sure that... I assure you and I promise you that House Republicans will want to cut more taxes in an additional bill. So you are not limiting yourself by passing this right now. Trust me. We will support that. 
but I have a feeling that might not really be what this is all about. Would the chair of the tax committee yield for a question, Madam Speaker? Representative Marquardt, will you yield to a question? Madam Speaker, yes, I will. He will, Representative Doubt. Representative Thank Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and uh, Representative Marquardt. Um, it, it seems to me, you know, actually in my 10 years in the legislature, this is the most surplus dollars we have had, $4.2 billion right now uh, of money to spend. It's also the most uh, turmoil that I've seen Minnesotans in as far as their joblessness and their kind of uncertainty about their businesses. Now would be the worst time that I have ever seen, and you'd have the worst excuse to ever raise taxes because we have more money than we've had in the last 10 years in surplus dollars. Can I have your commitment that since it appears that the majority party is going to pass on an opportunity to help out Minnesotans today, can I have your commitment that when this bill comes back that you're not holding this bill to include tax increases in it? Can you guarantee us and those watching at home that you're not going to use this as some tool to, to put tax increases into the bill? Representative Marquardt. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Dowd, I am going to guarantee you that we're going to put together a tax bill that is going to make Minnesota stronger. It's going to help people get back to work. Those who have lost their jobs are not only going to have tax cuts, but more aid. Those small businesses, and you know our restaurants and our bars and our fitness centers and our entertainment venues, those that have been hit the hardest. 88,000 jobs lost in leisure and hospitality. That's 32% of the workforce. Almost 400,000 jobs at the max lost during this COVID-19. I will guarantee to you in the state of Minnesota, we're gonna put together a bill that's gonna lift up Minnesota. It's gonna rebuild this state. It's gonna make families stronger workers stronger and our small businesses stronger. That I will guarantee to you, Representative Doubt. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll have another question here for him in a second. But what, and I appreciate the answer, but you didn't answer my question, um, which is, can you make a commitment to us that we will not have tax increases in that bill? Because I think what people at home are gonna get really frustrated with is if we've held up this, this, uh, this bill for some other provision that we think we're going to use in trade or negotiations later. That's wrong. That's absolutely, especially during a pandemic, that's wrong. So the governor put out his original budget. I haven't even reviewed everything that he put out today. I haven't seen what he's still proposing for tax increases. Um, but in his original budget, he was proposing a 10% tax increase on small businesses that would file on the personal side of the tax return. You know, he calls it taxing the rich, but that's actually taxing small businesses because in Minnesota, a business that files as an LLC pays taxes personally. So you're taxing employers who have struggled through the pandemic to keep people employed. That's not taxing the rich that's killing jobs. And it's a, absolutely the wrong thing to do right now. And then he also increased taxes on only every business that, that makes a profit. And it was a 15% increase on those folks. So 10% on the small businesses, 15% uh, increase on everybody else. I, I wonder after the closures that the governor forced on all these businesses through the last year, if there's going to be any employers left in the state of Minnesota. But I'm going to ask one more time, can you make a commitment to us that you are not going to tax, or, or excuse me, if you are not going to raise taxes on any Minnesotans or any Minnesota businesses in your tax bill? Can you ask that, answer that question, please? Representative Marquardt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Dowd. Representative Dowd, I do wish I was on the House floor so I could look you right in the eye and tell you again what I can guarantee. And I can't speak for the tax committee overall. We still have a lot of work to do because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But we're gonna guarantee when that tax bill comes out, that's gonna make Minnesota a stronger state. And it's gonna help build back up our workers and our families and our small businesses. 
That's what I can guarantee. And that's all I can say, tell you right now. We've got a lot of work to do in our tax committee. And I'm hoping you'll support our work. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Marquardt. I do have a lot of respect for you, and I've enjoyed working with you over the years here. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've been around here long enough to know what I just heard. Um, and, and what I, I think we all just heard was a guarantee that there are going to be tax increases in the, in the House Democrats' tax bill. Um, so, well, you know, this will not be the last debate we're going to have on the House floor about that. Um, and, and I am eager to have those debates because I really want you to all stand here at microphones in front of Minnesotans who you are so out of touch with and tell them that you're going to take money out of their pockets. Because today, when you have an opportunity to let the people who were out of work in the state of Minnesota keep the $600 a week that the federal government sent to them in the, in the early stimulus bills, you're passing on that opportunity. They don't get to keep that money. And, and, and for the Minnesotans who are watching this, who haven't figured this out yet, when you go and visit your tax, tax preparer or you do your own taxes online, you're going to have a huge tax bill. Because the state of Minnesota did not withhold state income tax on that $600 per week payment. So you got the whole thing. And I'm assuming like, like most, most Minnesotans, you needed the money. You were out of work and you probably spent it. And now, because the House Democrats cannot take action in this chamber on something that is so common sense and basic, you're getting screwed. And the people doing the screw job are sitting right here in the chamber. They're Democrats. And I can't believe they'd miss another opportunity to help Minnesotans. But in case you haven't figured out what's going on, they're holding the bill because they're going to put a huge tax increase in it. Because $4.2 billion isn't enough. The biggest surplus I've seen since I've been in St. Paul in 10 years. But that's not enough. They want more money. And the only place to get it from is the people in this state who have suffered for the last year. So you are down on the ground right now, Minnesotans, and they are going to kick you one last time. Well, I hope it's only one more time. They may just keep kicking you. But it's time that we step up, show some leadership, work together, and get stuff done. Everybody in here supports this provision, or they say they do. Then you have to ask yourself, why aren't we passing it? We brag about, well, we introduced this bill three weeks ago. You know what that sounds like to somebody listening at home? Then what the hell are you waiting for? You want them to wait another three weeks to get their tax return back? Or another month? Or another two months? How much harm can you cause to Minnesotans in one year? And I'm very sorry to say that I can tell right now that you aren't done yet. You're just going to keep kicking them while they're down. Members, please vote in favor of this. Let's actually do something bipartisan. And in this chamber, in this year, let's actually do something. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Dakota, the maker of the motion, Representative Garofalo. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, uh, just to provide some closing here, again, this is $269 million of tax relief to people exclusively who lost their jobs last year. And I want to give you a real-world example of an email and follow-up phone call I had two days ago. Uh, married couple in my district, both of them lost their jobs last year. Uh, they had to pay in to the state of Minnesota an extra $965 in taxes. Now, maybe that amount of money has a different uh, level of power to different people. But for a couple that was unemployed and is try trying to climb themselves out from where they were, it's very frustrating as they communicated to me that they're looking forward to actually getting the rebates from the federal government to pay off some of their bills. But at the same time, they have to take a chunk of that money and give it to the state of Minnesota. Okay, this is a, it's a real world problem for real people. They don't understand tax bills. They don't understand holding, uh, holding onto things for leverage. They don't get it. 
They just know that they lost their jobs and they're hurting right now and they need some help, okay? So if I could just offer some advice, uh, I suspect I know how this vote's gonna go. If I could give some advice to maybe some people on the other side of the aisle, um, call our bluff, right? Have one of your members get up and move to suspend the rules on the exact same thing at some point in the future, right? Say, well, Republicans, we're promising you we're not gonna amend it. We're promising you that if it goes over to the Senate and the Senate screws it and sends it back, that we're gonna side with you, we're gonna pile on to the Senate, call our bluff, do it, right? Because either way, we're either gonna all look good together, getting this done and actually helping people, or we're gonna look like total schmucks for stabbing you in the back and going the wrong way, right? You're in a win-win situation. The alternative to this is you're gonna keep blocking these things and every single day, there's gonna be another Minnesotan filling out their taxes, having to physically write a check to the government because they had the misfortune of being unemployed last year. Every day, the number of people getting more and more upset about this is gonna grow. So it's to all of our benefits, and most importantly to the people who lost their jobs, let's help them out. Madam Speaker, members, please vote yes. The clerk will take the roll. All those voting remotely, please vote. The clerk will call the names of those who have not voted yet. Anderson. Anderson. Bennett. Bennett, I. Bennett, I. Berg. No. Berg, no. Bernardi. No. Bernardi, no. Davids. Davids, I. Davids, I. Detmer. Detmer, I. Detmer, I. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, I. Grunhagen, I. Hausman. Hausman, no. Hausman, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Pryor. Pryor, no. Pryor, no. Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Schumacher. Schumacher, I. Schumacher, I. Sandin. No. Sandin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, yes. Swazinski, I. Tice. Tice, I. Tice, I. Jean T. Jean T, no. Jean T, no. Anderson. Anderson. The clerk will close the roll. Why? Madam Speaker. Representative Anderson. State your name. Uh, this is Representative Kosnick. I can see Representative Anderson trying to vote. And we have a 
some technical difficulty because he's on mute, but Representative Anderson, Anderson can call Representative Doubt and we can take his vote by uh, speakerphone if that technology works. Fionn. Anderson. <laughs> Anderson. It's not. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. There being 63 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. House file number 2307 was referred to the Committee on Taxes. Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. Senate concurrent resolution number four, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to adjournment for more than three days. The concurrent resolution is being referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. <coughs> a message from the Senate, Madam Speaker, I hereby announce the adoption by the Senate of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith transmitted. Senate concurrent resolution number five, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to Minnesota's peacetime emergency, terminating the peacetime emergency pursuant to authority granted under Minnesota statutes, section 12.31, subdivision two, paragraph B, message signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. <coughs> Doubt moves that the rules so far be so far suspended so that Senate current resolution number five be now considered and be placed upon its adoption. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, for those members that did not hear earlier today, the Senate uh, um, passed a concurrent resolution, uh, their concurrent resolution number five, uh, that would end the governor's uh, state of peacetime emergency as it relates to COVID. As you know, the numbers uh, from COVID are uh, coming down, which is very, very good news. The vaccines are getting distributed, I think. Um, I think I've seen statistics that we've had about 2 million doses of the vaccine in Minnesota thus far. Some of those are first and second doses, so it doesn't mean 2 million people, but we are well on the way. Uh, we did hear uh, earlier statistics from healthcare professionals that said if we could vaccinate 70% um, of those 65 and older, that we would impact 90% of the hospitalizations and deaths in the state of Minnesota. The good news is we reached that number a week, a week and a half ago, uh, two weeks ago probably now. Um, so we're well past that, uh, and, and uh, that, that prediction came true. We have impacted 90% of the hospitalizations and deaths in this state. Um, the, the, uh, the good news is that uh, COVID, while it's not completely over, uh, is uh, very soon to be in our rearview mirror. And, and this is an opportunity for us to step up and take a, a, uh, an equal role in responding to COVID in a very caring and thoughtful way uh, and doing that alongside the governor, just like our constitution envisions. Um, we have had emergency powers for a little over a year, longer than I think every, anybody ever anticipated, probably in the history of the state, nobody thought uh, an emergency power would go that long. And I will tell you, I don't have a great deal of confidence that the governor is going to want to end the emergency powers at any time. Why would you? So the only thing standing in the way of the governor and having permanent emergency powers is a handful of House Democrats who before the election were voting to end the powers and after the election, after their constituents voted for them, they somehow have changed their mind. I'll give you a pass. Because that was then when we were experiencing a, a, a peak. And right now, our COVID statistics are lower than they were when all these restrictions went in place. And the best part of that is the trend is we're trending down on all the numbers. And I'll remind you that when they put these restrictions in place, those numbers were trending up. So it is time to end the emergency powers. It is time for us to get Minnesota back opened up and to get people back to their normal lives. And this is the opportunity to do it. We can have this, uh, this 
resolution before us. If we can suspend the rules quickly here, we can have this passed and we can have the emergency powers ended within the hour. And today you've got an opportunity to do that. So I'm going to encourage members uh, to step up. I know, you know, folks are going to say, well, the governor needs to keep his emergency powers for this or that or because we're afraid to stand up to him, which I know now is not true. I know you are willing to stand up to him because you did it when he tried to fund law enforcement. So this is an opportunity for us to step up and, and be the co-equal branch of government that our Constitution envisions. So I would ask you to support this. And if you think that uh, you want to maintain some excuse that the governor needs us to keep us safe, I want to remind you of the actual data for the state of Wisconsin right next to us, which had the same peak at virtually exactly the same level of death rate and positive uh, uh, test rate and we were shut down and they were completely open. Remember that their Supreme Court shot down their governor's emergency powers last year. And so in Wisconsin, a state right next door with a very similar population, you have the, the best example that, that I hope we're willing to study when this is all over with. Because what you're going to find out is all of these restrictions the governor has had in place were unnecessary. That we, in this last peak, exactly the same as Wisconsin. In fact, if I put the two lines on a chart, two different colored lines, and I didn't tell you which color was which state, you wouldn't be able to tell. One state completely shut down, the other state, no restrictions. Exactly the same. So we have learned a lot about COVID in the last year. And we've learned a lot about courage in the last year. But you've got an opportunity right now to redeem yourselves and show that you've got one ounce of courage left in your bodies. Madam Speaker, I'd ask people to vote in favor, and I'd request a roll call. Representative Doubt requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? There are roughly 15 hands in the chamber. There will be a roll call. Discussion to the Doubt motion to suspend the rules. The member from St. Louis, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I apologize. I was having a, st a struggle getting to unmute. I want to correct the record. Uh, to some of the things that Representative Doubt referenced. I am one of the members that voted one way, as he says, prior to the election and different after the election, but his statement is incorrect. Even in December, which is post-election, I voted one way, which is different than I will vote today. And Representative Doubt, in my opinion, is not giving the full picture to the state of Minnesota on what those votes mean. The votes prior to session starting were votes to suspend the rules, to take up the debate, to understand what was going on with COVID, which now we are able to address during session. We are able to address the issues in committee, in session. And as far as all of the emergency powers, I disagree highly with Representative Doubt that every order should be uh, suspended or eliminated. Currently, there are executive orders which occur under the governor's emergency powers which are benef benefiting us in terms of mental health, telehealth, availability of getting vaccines in arms, having practitioners from out of state help us get these vaccines into our arms, 
And without these executive orders, without the governor's emergency powers in place, Minnesota would not be number five in the nation. We would be much further behind. So there are benefits. We are not beyond the pandemic. We are still seeing an increase in numbers in the state of Minnesota. And that doesn't mean that every executive order should not be addressed, but there are some that are truly a benefit to the state of Minnesota. And if Representative Doubt is going to say that certain members voted one way prior to the election and differently after the election, he has an obligation to tell the whole story. The votes are not identical. They are not the same type of vote. And there is a larger story to tell. So. I am just going to set the record straight and say that I think there are some benefits to emergency powers currently for the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Dakota, Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's hard to follow uh, Representative Sands said, but I just want to say, Wade, there may be doctors in the house. They, they, these are not the people right now that are giving us information on COVID. The experts I hear are telling us to be cautious, to follow pro protocols. So, I, so why anybody would listen to Representative Dodd at this point is beyond me. We need to do the right thing to keep our people safe. Thank you. Discussion to the doubt motion. Uh, the member from Wabasha, Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I find um, Representative Sandsteed's discussion and her memory of what happened interesting. Uh, she's a teacher and she seems to be practicing revisionist history. The reality is Representative Doubt is correct. Uh, we have a motion before us that will bring forward the bill to end the governor's emergency powers. Representative Sandsteed, that's the exact same bill that we are trying to bring forward in December. The only difference is the threshold is different here. The threshold is that we need a majority to do it now. And back then, uh, you and others who voted with us could have seen that it, take, it would have taken a two thirds or 90 votes in order to bring it forward. So there was never from the majority standpoint the danger, if you will, that we were going to actually succeed. So it allowed you and those other members to actually come forward and vote for it and vote with Republicans, but not have the consequences of it actually passing. Now, if you were consistent, Representative Sandsteed, and voted like you did and, you, and the other five members did last time, it would actually pass, we'd have the bill before us, and we'd be in position to actually remove the governor's emergency powers. Representative Sandsteed, Representative Doubt is correct. Revisionist history is not going to change uh, what happened here. We are not gonna allow that to happen. The reality is that we have before us the same motion or, or a, a, a similar motion to bring the same bill forward that would, have, would yield different results this time. You and others know it, Minnesota knows it. Let's be honest with them. Let's actually bring this forward and do what your constituents want to happen, Representative Sandsteed, what my constituents want to happen and what those constituents in those other five districts want their representatives to vote to happen, uh, to have happen, happen as well. Uh, vote the way your constituents want you to don't listen to the party bosses that are up there with the point of order madam right speaker now, but listen representative to the constituents representative Sanders. winkler you, state your point speaker. of order it's a habit representative Druskowski is bringing motives into the debate he is out of order uh, members please do not impugn the motives of other members or bring that into the debate and members to clarify this is a motion to suspend the rules that requires 90 votes the member from st louis representative sandstead Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is very, very important to note that the, the conversations and the votes that were taking place prior to session starting did not include robust conversations on the House floor about COVID, about 
how our constituencies across the state were being impacted. And that is different than what we are doing today. Yes, we're taking up a vote to suspend rules, but the difference is we are having the debate now. And being back in session, I have had an opportunity to pull the list of executive orders, the many executive orders that have been in place, that are currently in place, that have expired, and I personally have gone through them. This is something I have been able to do in session that I have not been able to do while we were in special sessions on very limited time with very limited staff. And having taken the time to go through each and every one of those executive orders, it is an absolute good conscience that I can say there are life-saving measures taking place as a result of executive orders issued under the governor's emergency powers that are beneficial to every Minnesotan, including getting the vaccines in arms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion on the doubt motion to suspend the rules. The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, uh, members, please vote no. We've been here many times before. It takes 90 votes. We will not have more than 69 votes for this. I'm sorry, we'll have 69 votes. We will have 69 votes against this motion again today as we will every day as long as you continue to bring it forward. Closing argument, the member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. And you heard it right here from the party bosses. 69 of you better vote no. The party bosses have spoken. But my, my bosses aren't my party. It's my constituents who can see the data and can understand what's going on. And I assure you that your, your constituents can understand what's going on as well. We've had this motion on the floor, I don't even know now, 17 times, I think. June 2020, two Democrats voted with every Republican and the, and the independents. In uh, July, that number went up to four. So we had four Democrats voting with all the Republicans and the independents. August, again, four Democrats. September, we got nine. We had an, uh, excuse me, uh, in, <laughs> I'm reading the date. Uh, in September, we had five, excuse me. So we got a fifth one. October 5, November 5, and December we peaked at 6. And Representative Sandsted, I apologize to you because you are correct, and I stand corrected, and I, I apologize. What I said was that uh, the election made the difference, and the election didn't make the difference. You did. You voted the same way after the election. But as soon as we changed the number of members in this chamber and your vote would have mattered, that's when you changed. So you are correct. You are correct. You continued to vote two times after the election in favor of this. But we went from a, a nine seat to a four seat different in this chamber. Representative Doubt, I just want to caution you not to get to motives. You're skating on the edge. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm not questioning anybody's motives. I'm just reminding them of what happened. Because had you voted in, in, in January, the way you voted in December, we could have ended these powers. <laughs> and that's what happened. It wasn't the election. Yeah, the election caused the narrower uh, majority and the, and, the, and the narrower numbers here in the House. But as soon as we could have actually done it, because we had six votes, had those six members prior to the election that were voting in December voted that same way in January, we would have ended the emergency powers in January. But in January, those votes changed when they would have mattered. And I don't need to question anybody's motives because everybody who's watching at home knows exactly why that happened. And the point executive order, orders. Madam Speaker. Stay your point of order, Representative Winkler. Representative Doubt did, in fact, invoke motives and not the merits of the matter in front of us. The question before the body 
is should the rules be suspended to take up a Senate concurrent resolution? The question before the body is not how anyone has ever voted in the past on this motion. It is what is in front of us right now. And talking about why and saying you're not talking about motives and then talking about motives still makes you talk about motives. He's out of order. Representative Doubt, please confine your remarks to the issue of whether the rules should be suspended and do not refer to the individual actions of members of the body. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I will note that I didn't question anybody's motives, but I do love, my favorite thing to do here is when I get the majority leader to question their motives for me. So thank you for that. Um, on the executive orders, Representative Sandstead, uh, there may be some executive orders that the governor has issued. I'm not gonna go through the exercise of calling on anybody and asking which ones do you think are important that should still be in place? And I almost, you know, it makes me wish that there was a group of people who could meet in a really big building in the, in the state's capital who could debate those issues and if they thought they were a good idea, they could pass them into law. Just, to, just if we had that, right? A little bit tongue in cheek, we do have that. And I'd ask you all to dig out your election certificates because that's what you were elected to do. If you think these executive orders are a good idea, let's bring them to the legislature, to the committees, let's have hearings on them. And if they're a good idea, let's put them in a bill and bring them here to the House floor and pass them into law. But Minnesotans aren't getting their money's worth out of House Democrats. Tenth week of session, we're almost done with it. Ha more than halfway through, five bills. Five bills off the House floor. The other day when I mentioned that, they quick scurried and did a rules committee and put a bunch of bills on the, on the agenda so we'd have those bills here on the House floor. They're gonna double their number today. Representative Doubt, you are impugning the motives of the majority leader, so Madam please Speaker. confine your remarks Madam to Speaker, the no issue. issue. Actually, um, I didn't do that at all. Madam Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry. State your name. Representative John Heinrich. Representative Heinrich, state your point of order. Point of parliamentary inquiry, Madam Speaker. What procedure are you using on the House floor to interrupt a member when you don't have a point of order in front of you? Representative Heinrich, I declined to rule and find Representative Doubt out of order. As a former Speaker of this House, he knows the rules and the customs very well and he knows when he's skating on the edge and gone over the edge, and I'm calling his attention to my declination to rule and his obligation not to impugn the motives of members. Representative Doubt. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick, state your point of order. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I reference uh, section 43 in Mason's uh, subsection four, uh, six. Whenever a deliberative body is making a decision, the members must have an opportunity to debate the questions. They have the right to express their opinions and hear the opinions of others. Madam Speaker, I suggest that the representative doubt is in order uh, in his manner of debate today. Representative Kosnick, uh, that section of Masons is not a, a part of the custom and usage of the Minnesota House. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. I know this stuff is tough to talk about. And I'm sure everybody wishes that we had 20 bills out of here and we had already provided some assurance that uh, Minnesotans who received federal dollars to help them keep their employees employed would have received uh, all of that money and that the state wasn't going to tax them on it. And I'm sure that Minnesotans who... Uh, got a supplement on their unemployment because they were displaced and out of work as a result of the governor's closures during the pandemic, wish that they had some certainty that they weren't going to be taxed on that and have to write a big check to the state government when we have way more money than we need right now. I'm sure that uh, the law enforcement agencies that potentially would respond to an emergency of civil unrest would love to have the certainty of knowing that they'd be reimbursed if they were called upon. And I'm sure that Minnesota schools would love to know 
and start planning for having some dollars available to get teachers and students in the classroom over this summer. But we haven't done those things on the House floor. We've talked about them all this week, and we haven't done any of them. And then we hear how there are executive orders in place by the governor that he's put in place over a year long of having emergency powers. And he needs to keep those emergency powers because these are things we need. When, and I, I should count, the number of opportunities that House Democrats have had to actually bring those things before this body and pass them into law. And those things have not happened. People who received PPP loans and they were forgiven will be taxed on that. People who received the unemployment benefit from the federal government will be taxed on that. Schools will not be receiving money for summer school and they won't be able to plan for that. And law enforcement agencies that may have to respond to a civil unrest in a state of emergency will not know if they will get reimbursed. Because Democrats in this chamber have not taken that action and they've had every opportunity to this week. And they have not taken action on anything that the governor has done in his emergency powers. They're happy to just let the governor run the state they're going to run interference while our constituents contact us every day and say, please give me a voice. And House Democrats are taking that voice away day after day after day. In Minnesota, during our peak, 125 cases per 100,000 people. That was the peak of COVID in Minnesota. In Wisconsin, 121. Wisconsin had a lower peak than the state of Minnesota. We were almost completely shut down and they were all the way open, no restrictions. The data and the science is clear. And at some point, when we can get Democrats in the Minnesota House to stop being science deniers and actually pull out and dust off their election certificates and do your job. Bring the bills to the committees. Have the hearings on the bills. Every executive order should have had a hearing in a, in a committee in this legislature. Every one of those executive orders should have come here to the floor. If you do not do that, you are not doing your job, period. No, we're just happy to let the governor do it. We'll just let him do everything. How long? When are we going to end them? When are these emergency powers going to end? At some, at some point, we went from two weeks to flatten the curve to we need to make sure nobody ever gets COVID ever. Do you remember the beginning? We actually thought COVID was worse at the beginning than it is now. And the strategy at the beginning when we thought it was worse was two weeks to flatten the curve. We knew people were going to get it. You can't stop people from getting a, a pandemic, the virus. You can't stop that. You can slow it down a little bit, but you can't stop it. And I hope, I, 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 I know, I know what you can do in one hand and what you can do in the other and which one you have more of. But I would hope that when this is all over, you'll have a hearing on that and we can actually look at the real data and the real statistics. We can bring people in and ask questions. And we can find out that these shutdowns that were put in place in Minnesota weren't necessary and didn't help. Because the science and the data is clear. So members, today is your opportunity. Today the Senate passed a resolution to end the emergency powers. Today we can bring it up. I don't know, I'd probably just withdraw it right now. The party bosses already told me what the result was going to be. 
69 Democrats are going to vote no today. Their leader asked them to. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Representative Winkler, please state your point of order. Madam Speaker, Representative Dowd's entire thesis in his speech is motives and personalities. He has not confined his remarks to the issue before us. He has waded into different motions that he has repeatedly brought, and he is out of order. He should not have the floor any longer. Representative Doubt, can you close without violating motives and personalities? I can try, Madam Speaker, <laughs> I can try. I will say that I'll Representative probably... Representative Doubt, I don't want to rule a former I, Speaker out of order. I assure you, though, I'm going to get a gold star today for being on message. But I will also remind you, Representative Winkler, that you did say on this House floor in this debate that there would be 69 Democrats voting against this. So when I repeat that, that is... Doubt. That has nothing to do with motives in debate, and it has nothing to do with personalities. You said that. I'm simply repeating it. I didn't say why you did that. Didn't say why at all. Didn't Doubt. question your motives at all. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Go ahead. You are out of order. Please cease speaking to motives and personalities. Please close out by referring to the subject matter of your motion. Because when you imply that the motives of a member are to vote consistent with a party leader, you are suggesting that their motives are not their independent judgment. Representative Doubt, please conclude your statement without referring to the motives of members. Madam Speaker, I rise to a point of order. Representative Doubt, please state your point of order. Uh, Representative Winkler told us how 69 Democrats were going to vote, and he was saying that they couldn't think for themselves when he did that. I think that's out of order. Representative Doubt, I find your point of order not well taken. The member from St. Louis, Representative Liz Lagarde. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I wasn't going to talk, but I feel, um, I feel compelled to share the, uh, the situation that is developing um, in my district and in my hometown uh, on the East Range. Right now, Aurora is at the heart of this COVID-19 hotspot which is uh, spreading to neighborhood counties. And it says that it, it is essential um, folks on the East Range have access to easy and no cost testing. The state is on their way on Monday and Tuesday to provide that um, testing. And I wanna read some of the quotes that was posted in the paper by leaders um, on the East Range. COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 testing at this time of heightened concern is incredibly important to the health of our fellow residents and to maintaining public confidence in the safety of our local businesses, says Doug Gregor, the mayor of Aurora. It is a wonderful way to demonstrate our community spirit and concern of our neighbors. Getting tested right away for, for community members to help keep COVID-19 from spreading and getting tested is a way to show support to our local businesses so they can remain open, says Mayor Wycombe, the city of Biwabic. With the pandemic winding down, we need to stay focused on wearing our masks, social distancing, and washing our hands, says Chris Breland, the mayor of Hoyt Lakes. As community leaders, I believe it is important to be tested as we move forward and have an opportunity to heal as a community and a country. Getting tested will aid in this healing, says John Skelton, chairman of the Town of White Board. It, it will definitely, as individuals may not know, they have it, prevent further spreading. This ultimately will aid in getting back to normal life. We are seeing a concerning spread of COVID-19 cases on the East Range area. And we are thankful that the state is offering these free and convenient testing opportunities, said Amy Westbrook, St. Louis County Health Division Director. I wanted to share that because this crisis is not gone. It is before us. And the state currently is coming to my district at no cost to my residents to make sure that they are safe and we stop the spread so it doesn't overwhelm our health system and we can keep our businesses open. 
Thank you. The member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would the Minority Leader, Representative Doubt, yield for a question? Representative Doubt, will you yield to a question? Sure. He will yield. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, Representative Doubt. I was very intrigued uh, during your comments when you made a reference to flatten the curve. And I remember Governor Walls when he used the term flatten the curve as a justification to usher in uh, his unilateral control over the state of Minnesota. But I haven't heard the term flatten the curve for many, many, many months. So my question, Madam Speaker, to Representative Doubt, can you remind me or do you, can you remind the body? Uh, when was the last time you've even heard the term flatten the curve? Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Lucero. I, I gotta tell you, I don't even know. Um, but I, I do remember back at the beginning, flatten the curve was, uh, you know, what they were saying we had to do. And I, knew, I think we all kind of knew it was probably going to be a little longer than two weeks, but it was, let's start with two weeks and then let's see where we go from there. But the, but the point of that wasn't the time. The point of that was the flatten the curve, right? That was the acknowledgement that we knew we couldn't stop COVID, that we were just slowing it down. So the whole strategy was that we weren't going to overwhelm our healthcare facilities. And remember that at that time when this all went in place, our numbers were, I think, I don't have them right in front of me, but I think they were at this level or higher. I think they were higher, actually. And they were trending up. So the hospitalizations, the death rates, the, the infection rates, all those things were, were, uh, were trending up. Now they're all trending down. So we're, we're obviously on the tail end of this, which is awesome news. I'm not, I'm, you know, let's not that, let that get lost in this. And, and I'll, I'll tell you that flatten the curve wasn't the only thing that was going on at the beginning of this that isn't going on right now. Do you remember the modeling? What a big deal that was at the beginning? That we had modeling that showed that 77,000 Minnesotans were going to die? I mean, thankfully, that was off by a magnitude of 10 times. Thankfully, it was. But remember that that prediction and that original modeling was made... If we put all of these restrictions in place, that was, the, that was the scenario we could expect. If we did nothing, it would have been greater than that. Then they revised it down to 50-some thousand, then it was 23,000. And then they got so criticized about the modeling that we haven't heard the word modeling for eight months or more. I did hear somebody say it on one of our phone calls, and I thought, gosh, I should put in a request to see the modeling. Because it implied to me they're still using modeling. But when they realized that the modeling was a, was a liability for them, they stopped talking about it. So we never got that information as a legislature. And we haven't had hearings on those things. So we don't have all that information. I don't know why. I can assure you that had I been Speaker of the House, we would have a hearing on every single executive order and I would bring every one of them here to the floor for a vote. I, I, I just separate from Republicans and Democrats and whether you think I'm a pain in your rear right now or not, like that is a basic thing that we should be doing. Just organizationally, there should be a hearing on every executive order in the Committee of Jurisdiction and we should look at all the information that went into making that decision so that we all have that information. So when we get contacted by our constituents, we can answer those questions. But that's not happening. So it's been, I appreciate the question, Representative Lucero, because um, I, I, it is funny, and I, I hope that, you know, this has been going on so long that I think people forgot what the beginning was like and what we thought at the beginning and what our expectations were at the beginning. And somehow... Through the last year, we've become so numbed that this is just like business as usual, right? Well, the governor just has emergency powers. Why? The legislature's in session. I'm not going to break out the statute book and read you the definition of emergency again under chapter 12. But the reality is an emergency does not exist according to that definition. And anything that you've, I, 
I actually get offended when people say to me, well, we need the, we need the emergency powers to stay in place because of this. You know, Representative Liz Lagarde just mentioned that he appreciates that the testing is happening. I do too. I think that's great. But we don't need emergency powers to do that testing. We could have passed it right here off the House floor. In fact, I think we did provide money for testing. I know we passed $550 million of funding early on for some of that was for testing, right? We can do all of that or we can do none of that. But I actually get offended when people say, no, we, we need it in place because this is in place. Well, if that's in place, bring it here to the House floor and let's pass it into law. Because if it makes sense, you're going to get our votes to vote for it too. But if it doesn't, we're going to have a great debate here on the House floor about what's good for Minnesotans. But instead, we debate motions to suspend the rules where we need 90 votes to bring this up. People at home get frustrated when they watch all of this. But I do, your point is very valid, Representative Lucero, because I, I, and I want to encourage all members of the legislature to think back, go back and read some news articles. Go back and pull some stuff from last March, February, March, April. What did we think at the time? What did we know at the time? What were our expectations at the time? What did the governor say at the time? What did we all say at the time? And what were the statistics at the time? What was the, the case positivity rate? What was the death rate? What was the hospitalizations? Look at that stuff. Because it, it gives you a window into what your mindset was a year ago. And is it and should it be different now? And then put, try to put yourself back in your shoes at that time and think, gosh, at the time, did I think this could go on for one full year? Did I think that was possible? I bet the answer is none of us did. I, I remember thinking at the time, gosh, this is going to be 60 days and we're going to be back to normal. But unfortunately, here we are. And, and that's why, and I know you get sick of these motions coming up, and it's coming up today because the Senate passed it today. So we've actually got an opportunity today to end the emergency powers, right? We, we haven't always had that opportunity. Sometimes they meet at noon and we meet at 3.30 and we bring up a motion and it's a Thursday and they wouldn't even be able to take it up until Monday, right? So you're not really ending them right away. This time you could. We could end it, I said, within the hour. I guess if I'd sit down and shut up, we could have a vote. But the reality is we could do it within this hour. That's how quick the emergency powers would end. All we have to do is pass this and they're done. And then we can govern this and, and manage this pandemic with the governor. And if we want testing, we can provide money and, and provide the, the, the legislative authority to have testing. And if we want all the other stuff, we can do that too. But please, please, please do not use the excuse in this chamber that we can't. We absolutely can. And I'll bet that your constituents believe in you, and that's why they voted for you. They believe that you can. Somehow you've convinced yourself you can't. I think this time in history is very interesting. I think this time in history, and I think you've heard other great leaders in history say, that great leaders aren't defined by themselves necessarily. They're defined by the times that, that, they, that they lead during and how they respond to it. And great leaders rise up during difficult times and they respond. And unfortunately, you have failed to rise up when the state needed you the most. So Representative Lucero, thank you for the question. There being no further discussion. Madam Speaker, I still have the floor. Oh, Representative Lucero, you are correct. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I appreciate that, Representative Doubt. Uh, that is my recollection as well. It's been many, many months, more than six months, eight months. Uh, we have one set of justifications, flatten the curve, 
modeling that ushered in our present unilateral control by Governor Walls, but then we had a bait and switch where we are right now. And it is incredibly frustrating to members of this body, to all of hardworking Minnesotans, that the Democrat majority fails to lead and instead to rationalize their continued protecting of emergency powers, they engage in a continued effort of fear porn. Please vote green to this motion. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the motion. Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those members who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Anderson. Anderson, yes. Anderson, aye. Bennett. Bennett, aye. Bennett, aye. Berg. No. Berg, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bo. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Davids. Davids, aye. Davids, aye. Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Uh, Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Pearson. Uh, Pearson votes aye. Pearson aye. Pryor. Pryor, no. Pryor, no. Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Sandin. No. Sandin, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Zhang T. Zhang T, no. Zhang T, no. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 63 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. Senate concurrent resolution number five is being referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. Report from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. 
<clears throat> Winkler from the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration, pursuant to Rules 1.21 and 3.33, designates the following bills to be placed on the calendar for the day for Monday, March 22nd, 2021, and establishes the pre-filing requirement for amendments offered to the following bills, House File Numbers 109, 844, and 310. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 1438. The clerk will report the bill. House File number 1438, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to health care, the second engrossment. Representative Liebling, do you want to take your amendment right away as well? Yes, Madam Speaker, I would. Thank you. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Liebling moves to amend House File Number 1438. The second engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A2. The member from Olmsted, Representative Liebling, to your bill and your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As we get started here, I'd like to um, ask members to adopt the author's amendment. All this does is remove the appropriation section of the bill. And if we could go ahead and do that, I would then explain why we're able to do that. All those in favor of the Liebling Amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say aye. no. The motion prevails. No. Representative Liebling. All right. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker and members. So um, as we know, one of the best tools we now have against COVID-19 is vaccination. And we are, in fact, in a race to vaccinate enough Minnesotans to control the pandemic. I am very grateful to the Biden administration for working hard to increase the number of vaccine doses available to Minnesotans. As we all know, these doses have to be administered as quickly as possible. House File 1438 helps to get doses into arms by raising the rate paid for vaccine administration under medical assistance to the higher Medicare rate. This vaccine is more complicated and expensive to handle than others, so this increased rate should help more healthcare providers participate in the effort. Under the American Rescue Plan, the federal government will pay for 100% of this cost beginning April 1st, and that is why we were able to remove the appropriations section of the original bill. It is no longer needed, and this bill is now cost neutral for Minnesota. I have been advised the other body will accept this amended bill and it can quickly move to the governor for his signature. So thank you for your support of House File 1438. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House File number 1438 as amended. Third reading as amended. Discussion to the bill. Any discussion to the bill? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Will those members voting remotely please vote? Will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Anderson. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Bennett. Bennett, I. Bennett, I. Berg. Berg, I. Berg, I. Bernardi. I. Bernardi, I. Bo. Bo, I. Bo, I. Carlson. <coughs> Carlson. Davids. David's aye. David's aye. Detmer. 
Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Gomez. <clears throat> Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Hollins. Hollins, aye. Hollins, aye. Johnson. Johnson, aye. Johnson, aye. Katiza Watillon. Katiza with two and I. Mariani. Mariani, I. Mariani, I. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Pryor. Pryor, I. Pryor, I. Robbins. <clears throat> Robbins, I. Sandell. Sandel, aye. Sandel, aye. Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Sundin. <clears throat> aye. Sundin, aye. Swazinski. Aye. Swazinski, aye. Zhang T. Zhang T, aye. Zhang T, aye. Carlson. Carlson, aye. <clears throat> The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 132 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 333. <clears throat> The clerk will report the bill. House file number 333, number two on the calendar for the day, an act relating to commerce. The member from Hennepin, Representative Katizo Atun, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, House file 333 is a consumer protection bill that supports seniors who wish to age in place in their homes through a reverse mortgage. In a 2019 report, the General Accounting Office indicated that defaults on reverse mortgages have risen almost tenfold from just 2% in 2014 to 18% in 2018. I worked with legal aid and stakeholders over the past year on language that works to protect seniors due to diminished capacity from defaulting on taxes and insurance or not returning documents to lenders that certify continued residence in their primary home. This bill does three things. It provides the opportunity to designate a third party to get notices of defaults and delinquencies that could lead to foreclosure. It requires the servicer to send those notices to that third party, and it gives the borrower an opportunity to stop the foreclosure if the notices were not sent. The idea is that any defaults or other problems that can, can be caught and addressed far upstream long before a foreclosure is commenced. I would appreciate your support. There are no f amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House File number 333. Third reading, House File 333. <laughs> Any discussion to the bill? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Anderson. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Bennett. Bennett, I. Bennett, I. Berg. 
Berg, aye. Berg, aye. Bernardi. Bernardi, aye. Bernardi, aye. Bo. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Carlson. Carlson, aye. Davids. Davids, aye. Davids, aye. Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Gomez. Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Hollins. Hollins, aye. Hollins, aye. Johnson. Johnson, aye. Johnson, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Pearson. Pearson, votes aye. Pearson, aye. Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Sandell. Sandell, aye. Sandell, aye. Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Sandin. Aye. Sandin, aye. Swazinski. Aye. Swazinski, aye. Zhang T. Zhang T, aye. Zhang T, aye. Joachim. Joachim, aye. Joachim, aye. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 132 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. <laughs> The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 652. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File number 652, number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating to insurance, the first engrossment. The member from Anoka, Representative Cagle, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. House File 652 is um, a something that came out of the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council. Um, when this council, when we were able to travel the state, we went up to um, White Earth and we heard that members were getting their life insurance policies canceled due to an opioid antagonist prescription like Narcan. Um, somebody in their household or one of their loved ones um, may have been facing an opioid use disorder and so they um, were keeping Narcan on hand to help save their lives. <clears throat> So this bill would prohibit underwriters from canceling or not renewing or modifying policies due solely because of a prescription for an opioid antagonist. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House file number 652. Third reading, discussion to the bill. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Turn it down. Members, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Anderson. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Bennett. Bennett, aye. Bennett, aye. Berg. Berg, aye. Berg, aye. Bernardi. Bernardi, aye. Bernardi, aye. Bo. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Davids. Davids, aye. Davids, aye. Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Erickson. Aye. Erickson, aye. Gomez. Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Hassan. Hassan, aye. Hassan, aye. Houseman. 
Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Hollins. Hollins, I. Hollins, I. Johnson. Johnson, I. Johnson, I. Mariani. Mariani, I. Mariani, I. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. Moran. Moran, I. Moran, I. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Novotny. Novotny, I. Novotny, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Pryor. Pryor, I. Pryor, I. Sandell. Sandell, I. Sandell, I. Schumacher. Schumacher, I. Schumacher, I. Sandin. I. Sandin, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, I. Zhang T. Zhang T, I. Zhang T, I. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 128 ayes and four nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 395. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate file number 395, number four on the calendar for the day, an act relating to domestic violence. The member from Ramsey, Representative Moeller, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Senate file 395 is the Uniform Recognition and Enforcement of Canadian Orders for Protection Act. Minnesota already recognizes domestic violence protection orders from other states, and this act would expand reciprocity to Canada. This bill is the result of the collaboration between the Uniform Law Commission and the Uniform Law Conference of Canada. Currently, several Canadian provinces recognize and enforce Minnesota orders for protection. This Uniform Act has been enacted in six states, including North Dakota and Wisconsin. And as a uh, state bordering Canada, it's important that we pass the act in order to ensure the safety of those who come into Minnesota from Canada with an order for protection. According to the executive director of the Global Rights for Women who testified and supported the bill, 137 women per day are killed worldwide by family members. Violence Free Minnesota also testified and supported the bill that victim survivors who come to Minnesota from Canada to travel, work, attend school, visit family, or relocate for their safety or any other reason should expect that their protection orders will be enforced in all jurisdictions on either side of the border. They shared the story in committee of a woman from Canada who came to Brainerd and whose safety was jeopardized because we don't, do not currently recognize can, Canadian protective orders. I appreciate your support members and thank you, Madam Speaker. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 395. Third reading, any discussion to the bill? Seeing no discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Anderson. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Bennett. Bennett, I. Bennett, I. Berg. Berg, I. Berg, I. Bernardi. Bernardi, I. Bernardi, I. Bull. Bull, I. Bull, I. Bolden. Bolden, I. Bo Bolden, I. Davids. Davids, I. Davids, I. Detmer. Detmer, I. Detmer, I. Erickson. Erickson, I. Erickson, I. Gomez. Gomez. Gomez, I. Gomez, I. Grunhagen. Gomez, I. Grunhagen. Grunhagen. 
Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Hassan. Hassan, aye. Hassan, aye. Houseman. Houseman, aye. Houseman, aye. Hollins. Hollins, aye. Hollins, aye. Johnson. Johnson, aye. Johnson, aye. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Moran. Moran, aye. Moran, aye. Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Novotny. Novotny, aye. Novotny, aye. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Sandell. Sandel, aye. Sandel, aye. Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Sundin. Aye. Sundin, aye. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Walgamot. Walgamot, aye. Zhang T. Zhang T, aye. Zhang T, aye. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 131 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The last bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 440. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File Number 440, number five on the calendar for the day, an act relating to real property, the first engrossment. Representative Hollins, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House File uh, 418, or Senate File 440, is an expansion to our statutory protections for equity stripping scams. Equity stripping scams are intended to literally swindle a homeowner who is in financial distress and who is in mortgage foreclosure out of Ugh. their home. Scammers uh, solicit desperate homeowners with a promise to save their home and um, have them deed the house over to them and then set up a situation where the homeowner is destined to fail at paying, at being able to pay back the rate in which the scammer has um, set it. So this scam is widespread, but it's particularly impacting elderly and low-income homeowners who find themselves in desperate situations. Um, our original protections were actually uh, created in 2004, and we periodically updated them to encompass things like um, loan modification scams, as well as um, expanding them to cover family farms. So what we're looking to do here is to tighten up the language and to make sure that this, these protections apply to tax forfeiture cases as well. What this bill does is three things. It makes amendments throughout Chapter 325 to delete references to mortgage and foreclosure and specify that the coverage of the chapter extends to tax forfeiture properties and homeowners association foreclosures. It extends from four to six years, the statute of limitations, to take an action for violation to make this statute consistent with general statutes providing for a six-year statute of limitations on contract claims. And it codifies Hennepin County's property tax division's policy of returning the certificate of redemption to the homeowner when an investor redeems it. Um, uh, this is a pretty simple statute, a uh, simple bill that is just tightening up language to make sure there are no loopholes where people can be taken advantage of. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 440. Third reading. The member from Blue Earth, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative, if Representative Hollins would yield for a question. Representative Hollins, will you yield to a question? Yes. She will yield. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Hollins. Um, I've, uh, I've actually written a bill, a House File 1552, that deals with um, this uh, equity scam that's being run um, also because it's of great concern. I've been contacted by uh, uh, nearby constituents um, who lost their house to tax forfeiture. And under current law, 
the government actually strips the entire amount of equity out of the home. If someone uh, owns their home free and clear in the retired, um, and I've heard uh, twice now from people whose uh, parents or grandparents have lost their home where the, the government has taken it because they only owe $8,000 on a home that might be worth $100,000, and then that home is sold at auction, the government scams the previous homeowner out of all of their equity. And so for a company to come forward before they lose their home due to tax forfeiture and offer to pay them, uh, pay off their taxes and give them um, a, a small amount of money above that is better than that person losing the entire house to the government, which then scams them out of their equity. And that, uh, you know, my bill would actually return all of the equity to the homeowner after the government sells the property at auction uh, minus, you know, reasonable fees. Does your bill, uh, require that the that if the house is lost to tax forfeiture that the government return um, all the excess equity to the owner or does the government just uh, continue to scam the owners out of it representative hollands i don't i'm not sure that i entirely understand the question this is specifically um designed to prevent outside entities who are seeking to scam the individuals it doesn't control what the government does with uh, properties of that nature. The government is, is free to either, you know, set a deal with individuals or, you know, deal with the tax forfeiture in whatever way they see fit. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Hollins, my, I guess, w when you talk about uh, companies coming in and scamming people, um, it's, it's because they approach someone who's already losing their house to foreclosure and they've not been able to sell it, either the house isn't marketable or they're losing the house. And a company can come in and pay them less than what would normally go on the, on the open market or possibly could if they had more time um, and perhaps make an arrangement for that person to stay there and rent the property. Um, and it, it may, yes, there's, there are people that may have be taken advantage of, but you have to understand if you're going to prevent a company from coming in and trying to give the homeowner something out of the deal, um, then you're going to you're basically empowering government um, to be the only option, and, and, and the government will just take the property um, for whatever that person owes in taxes, sell it at auction, and then continue so continue to keep all this money, and the homeowner gets nothing. If 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 you have a house that's paid off. And all you're, all you're responsible for paying is your property taxes. And uh, maybe you have a parent or a grandparent who isn't following their bills and they get two years behind in property taxes and they don't see the notices coming that the property is going to be taken for tax forfeiture. Um, a, a company watches for those numbers and can approach that person and offer them something, give them twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. If your bill prevents a company from coming in and making an offer to pay the property taxes on it, then you're, you're, you're doing the, the, the homeowner a disservice. Um, and, and especially if the, if the government is going to keep all of the money from the sale of the property um, above what they owe in property taxes. So if, 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 you don't, uh, if your bill doesn't, doesn't protect the person by returning the equity from tax forfeiture properties, um, then I'm gonna be voting no on the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And um, to the point just raised, I guess <clears throat> I would like to just clarify that, um, you know, there's different uh, processes in which uh, people who get into trouble uh, have certain redemption rights according to state statute and state law. <clears throat> and I think, uh, Representative Munson, what you're referring to uh, oftentimes uh, is a situation that happens after sheriff sale. And there's still some redemption rights, but usually what happens is people will show up on the courthouse steps and make uh, a bid or an offer uh, for uh, winning the bid, if you will, on foreclosed property on the sheriff's uh, sale. And there's still a redemption period after sheriff's sale. and. I think, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Munson, but what happens oftentimes in that situation, once a person has already uh, gone through sheriff's sale, there's still redemption rights. And there are companies that 
uh, can come in or even individual investors who will actually uh, step in front of those successful share sale bidders and provide uh, some equity, uh, whatever that negotiated amount is, to actually have a conveyance uh, to them in a, in a manner of a quick claim deed or whatever. And they will actually step in front of the sheriff sale and they will redeem the property and therefore move on. And the person who bid at sheriff sale is the loser, uh, not the property owner. So this is uh, something that has uh, come to you know, many people's attention during uh, the Great Recession when a number of people were facing foreclosure. But what Representative Hollins is really attempting to do is to make sure that there's an actual name on the deed and a conveyance and protecting the homeowner uh, prior to sheriff sale and preventing these scammers from doing just that. So I think um, you may be confusing that which this law doesn't prevent and that is uh, people still can maybe salvage a little bit of equity that they have uh, after sheriff sale and that's, that's when this oftentimes occurs. So uh, to that end, uh, I hope that maybe I've uh, provided a little bit of clarity. It is troubling when people have 100% equity in their home and uh, fixed incomes, as you described, uh, that they would actually go into tax uh, foreclosure. Uh, most counties allow property owners uh, to enter into what is referred to as a confession of judgment, enter into a payment plan in those circumstances. But I would find it very difficult that anybody that owns their property free and clear losing their home to tax forfeiture when there's plenty of equity there to get some type of a loan, even if it's at a rate that's untenable for some, that's really not what, what this bill is uh, talking about. So I hope that maybe I've put a little bit of light on that, but uh, I, I think um, Representative Holland's bill is a good bill and we should prevent uh, people from being taken advantage of where uh, they're not to sheriff sale or not to foreclosure yet and uh, be, being uh, abused. So uh, I'm gonna support the bill. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I just wanted to say that I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's great to be in a position where I can say that I, I agree with a lot of what Representative Hurtas was just saying. I think he, he was, uh, that was a, a great uh, discussion. Uh, and a great clarification. And I, I wanted to just make the, the quick point, and I'm, I'm probably mostly just echoing Representative Hurtas to Representative Munson that, uh, you know, this bill actually does protect the homeowner in the situation that Representative Munson is, is describing, uh, because it ensures that any proceeds flow to the homeowner, any equity flows to the homeowner and not a, a, a scammer. This is a limited bill. It's a common sense bill. It passed the Senate 67 uh, to zero. Uh, I really think Rep Representative Hollins uh, has brought forward a, a bill that we can all get behind and I urge members to vote green. The member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, to the uh, Hollins bill and what representatives months While we are waiting for Representative O'Driscoll to get better uh, internet service, we will Speaker. go to the next uh, member. The member Madam from- Speaker. Oh, Representative O'Driscoll, if you could just- For whatever just... reason, um, internet in my neighborhood seems to be very unstable tonight. That is also one of the reasons why I missed the last vote. <laughs> um, uh, I'm hoping that Representative Hollins would yield to a question and I'm just gonna put some background information out. It has to do with the comments today from Representatives Munson, Hurtas and Stevenson, or excuse me, Representative Stevenson. Um, so what we're looking at here are two different laws. One is the tax forfeiture for non-payment of property taxes, which is not covered in this bill. And as Representative Munson said, he may have a bill that deals with that topic. This bill deals with the issue, as I recall from, from committee, that if I were to come in and to buy, and I'll just use Representative Hollins as an example, her home in a distressed situation, I certainly can pay her something or something of value and get a quit claim deed or, or uh, acquire title of that property. She can walk away. Where the issue that's covered in this bill is if I then go back to Representative Hollins and I say, uh, would you like to rent the property from me? Would you like me to finance this for you? 
that's where the um, the Maybe Representative O'Driscoll, you'd want to text your um, comments to another member and have them raise that issue. We have lost you again. Uh, the member from Wright, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I was actually going to ask uh, Representative O'Driscoll to yield, but I, I won't do that uh, just because of his internet instability. But what I believe he was, uh, part, portions of what he was about to say and uh, portions of what uh, Representative Munson was saying was when there are multiple types of foreclosure. There's lender foreclosure, for example. There's uh, tax foreclosure, for example. There's HOA foreclosure, for example. So I believe if I understood Representative Munson correctly, in the scenario where a homeowner has equity in their property, and in the case of a, uh, a, a lender foreclosure, which would go to a sheriff sale, which kicks off the generally speaking six month redemption period, or in the case of a homeowners uh, association foreclosure, my recollection, which is what I was going to ask O'Driscoll, Representative O'Driscoll to confirm, my recollection is when that property is sold, the delta, the balance between what it's sold for and uh, what uh, the amount of equity there is, that amount of cash has to go or it, under those scenarios goes to the homeowner after it's sold to sheriff sale the lender is not permitted to keep the the equity after it's sold to sheriff sale once they recover anything above and beyond what the the loan amount might be if my recollection is correct in the case that representative munson was bringing up in a tax foreclosure scenario unlike the other two scenarios when somebody can't pay their tax and they confiscate or they foreclose on the property and then the government sells the property at tax auction the amount of equity isn't given to the homeowner of which the property was foreclosed on, it's instead kept by the government. That's what I think Representative Munson was discussing. And I fully agree with what Representative Munson was saying is the government shouldn't be in a scenario where they are keeping the equity from the sale of the property. But again, that's an entirely different topic than what's being addressed in the Representative Holland's bill. And I do support uh, the comments of everybody uh, that has spoken and I do support this bill as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Lacero. The only, I don't see any other names on the list. Anybody else? Can I speak just quickly? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I was Rep also on the please, list. Uh, please identify yourself. Representative Munson? Yes, uh, Representative Munson. Okay. Yeah. Representative uh, I just Munson. Wanted to, yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, I, and uh, thank you, everybody who was chiming in. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not yet convinced that the bill does not, uh, the, the the bill addresses a specific situation with tax abatement or with tax tax forfeiture, um, and I'm just a little concerned that uh, that that the government will be uh, continuing to to keep the equity that's built in the home um, during a. Uh, a sale after tax forfeiture, but um, but I'm glad we had the conversation today, and I think for the most part, um, Representative Hollins, your bill is good. So, um, um, thank you for bringing it forward. Okay, uh, Representative Odris O'Driscoll is last on my list of members to speak to the bill. Representative O'Driscoll, are you with us again, or are you still experiencing problems? I'm not seeing you on the screen. Okay, uh, Representative Hollins, if you want to uh, provide some closing remarks to your bill, please. Sure, thank you. I, I appreciate this really um, robust discussion that we've had. Um, I did want to point out to Representative Munson that I appreciate his concerns and that, um, you know, I would say that this bill actually does protect the homeowners in the situation that you're talking about because the homeowner gets back the deed from the county and that puts the power back in the homeowner's hands instead of um, in the government's hands. So if that's a concern of yours, it is at least partially addressed by this bill. Um, that being said, I appreciate the conversation and I, I hope that you, um, that you folks can support it. Thank you so much. Thank you, representatives. Uh, thank you, Representative Hollins. Uh, the clerk will take the roll.
Members, those that are voting remotely, please vote. Okay, the clerk will call the names of those members that have not voted yet. Anderson. Anderson, I. Anderson, I. Bennett. Bennett, I. Bennett, I. Berg. Berg, I. Berg, I. Bernardi. Bernardi, I. Bernardi, I. Bull. Bo I. Bo I. Bolden. Bolden I. Bolden I. Davids. Davids I. Davids I. Erickson. Erickson I. Erickson I. Gomez. Gomez I. Gomez I. Grunhagen. Grunhagen I. Grun Grunhagen I. Hamilton. Hamilton I. Hamilton I. Hassan. Hassan I. Hassan I. Houseman. Houseman I. Houseman I. Hollins. Hollins I. Hollins I. Johnson. Johnson I. Johnson I. Mariani. Mariani I. Mariani I. Mason. Mason I. Mason I. Nash. Nash I. Nash I. Novotny. Novotny I. Novotny I. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll. Pearson. Pearson I. Pearson I. Pryor. Pryor I. Pryor I. Sandell. Sandell I. Sandell I. Schumacher. Schumacher I. Schumacher I. Sundin. <clears throat> I. Sundin I. Swazinski. Swazinski I. Swazinski I. West. West I. West I. Wagamop. Wogamot I, Zhang T. Zhang T I. Zhang T I, Yuakim. Yuakim I. Yuakim I, O'Driscoll. We're trying to get him. Yeah. Oh, wait a sec. Sure. O'Driscoll. O'Driscoll votes I. Have all the members voted who wish to vote? The clerk, well, let's give it a second. I think that's everybody. Mm -hmm. the, cloak, the clerk will close the roll. Sorry, with 132 eyes. With 132 eyes and zero nays, the motion prevails. Motions and resolutions. Yep. Yep. There are copies of non-controversial motions at the at the House desk and online. If there are no objections, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objections, the motions prevail. <clears throat> Lippert moves that House Bill number 2044 be recalled from the Committee on Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Oops. and be re referred to the Committee on Commerce, Finance and Policy. Can you call on Lippert to address the motion? Yes. Representative Lippert, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is my motion. House File 2044 creates an innovative finance authority that's a clean energy and energy efficiency of project accelerator. Um, it was re-referred to climate and energy, but it needs to go to commerce. And I talked with both chairs um, and would appreciate if the bill can get to commerce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the motion prevails. Oh, I'm sorry. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed aye. say no. The motion prevails. Katiza Batuan moves that House File number 2146 be recalled from the Committee on Education Finance and be re referred to the Committee on Commerce, Finance, and Policy.
Representative Katiza Ratoon, to your motion. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, that is my motion. House File 2146 is an appropriation for the Minnesota Council on Economic Education. It's drawing from existing unused funding in the consumer education account in a special revenue fund with the Department of Commerce. Due to the funding source being in an account under the Department of Commerce jurisdiction, this bill should be heard in the Commerce Committee. I've spoken with both chairs and they are in support of this motion. Any discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed aye. say no. Aye. The motion prevails. <clears throat> Kreshaw moves that the rules of the House be so far suspended that House File Number 2274 be recalled from the Committee on Education Finance, be given its second and third readings, and be placed upon its final passage. Representative Trisha, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, I won't get into the specifics of the bill. Hopefully, if we can suspend the rules and make the motion successful, we can have a more robust discussion on the bill itself. I'll just say that in these very unprecedented times, uh, we need to make sure that we're moving as quick as we can. I know the majority party has offered uh, their version. We'd like to offer our side as well. Uh, both these bills will have good ideas. and. Through the robust debate, perhaps we can mirror those ideas and solve the common problem that we see, which is summer learning programs, getting funds to school to address the learning loss, uh, and helping our schools with the very, very unprecedented challenges they have in front of them. Uh, our bill uh, that I would bring forward has uh, school link mental health funding, has CARES equity aid, summer transportation, and early learning scholarships. Um, to help solve some of those problems. But more importantly, it's getting the money to the schools in a timely manner. So with that members, I would ask for support uh, in the motion to suspend the rules. Representative McDonald to the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I I made a mistake with the uh, hand thing. Okay, uh, any, thir any further discussion? Mr. Chair? Yes, please identify yourself. Uh, Representative Cresha? Yes, Representative Cresha. I'm sorry, I had, in my haste, I forgot to ask for a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Members, a roll call has been requested. 15 hands. Seeing 15 hands, we will have a roll call. Any further discussion on the Cresha motion? Yes. Representative Downs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker um, and members. And thank you, Representative Cresha, for bringing this bill. Obviously, uh, this is the fourth bill uh, in a series of bills that the Republicans have brought to the House floor uh, this week. Um, all of these are non-controversial, uh, should be very broadly supported, um, and, and uh, they all have some urgency. And, and this one is no different. Uh, this one would provide money. Uh, it's the same amount of money that the governor has asked for, uh, for summer school program for kids. Uh, districts can opt into this, uh, and this would require that kids and teachers both be in a classroom um, and allow them an opportunity. If, if they deem that that's uh, what they want to do locally, uh, this would allow them the opportunity to get their kids kind of caught up for missing uh, some of the last year. So this is a really important vote and a, and a very uh, important bill to do now so that uh, folks can uh, have some assurance that this is going to be happening and they can start planning for it. Again, uh, this is timely. Uh, we've already voted this week. Uh, uh, Democrats in the House have voted to block exempting PPP loans from tax. Uh, they have blocked uh, the, the uh, exemption of the UI benefits from tax. Um, they have blocked funding for law enforcement this week. Um, and now we're going to vote on summer school. Um, to this point in session, uh, prior to today, uh, House Democrats had passed five bills into law in the 10th week of session. Today, we doubled that. 
We took up the first bill today at 5.15 p.m., and we passed the last one at 5.54. So in 10 weeks, uh, we had five bills, and in 35, 39 minutes, we had five more. So what we showed today is that we can work together, we can get our work done, we can do it quickly, and we can do the things that Minnesotans want us to do. But the troubling theme here is that when Democrats bring up a bill, we can pass five of them in 39 minutes. When Republicans bring up a bill that, by the way, is broadly supported by people on both sides of the aisle. But when Republicans bring up a bill, we have debate and then it gets shot down. These are things Minnesotans want. We are begging to work with you and do the things that Minnesotans want and to do them now. These are timely. They can't wait. So members, uh, thank you, Representative Kresha, for bringing this forward. Members, uh, let's take an opportunity to work together. Let's do what we know is right. This bill does not fund a bunch of bureaucrat bureaucrats at the Department of Education. This money will go to school districts and will go into classrooms where teachers and students belong. And this is your opportunity to do it. Let's not pass up this opportunity and bring up another bill next week that, um, that isn't as good as this one, frankly. So um, let's not miss this opportunity to work together. Let's close out the day on a high note. Let's pass some funding for education. Let's get these kids and teachers back into classrooms. Please vote yes. Mr. Speaker. Please identify yourself. Uh, Representative Daphne. Representative Daphne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Members, I'm gonna ask for a no vote on the Crucia motion. While I'm glad that my GOP colleagues have discovered that summer is coming, uh, the late uh, introduction of this bill uh, should cause us all pause. Uh, the bill that will be coming to the floor next week that passed on a strong bipartisan vote out of Ways and Means uh, last night, House File 1604, uh, includes elements that were first heard in January in the education uh, committees, uh, merged then with House File 1604 and heard uh, on a bipartisan basis uh, in the Education Finance Committee. And as I said, moved through the, is moving through the process with a strong bipartisan vote out of the Ways and Means Committee last night. We'll be coming to the floor. It's been vetted. It's been reviewed. Uh, it's been considered. And I would ask members uh, to respect the process, to respect the members who uh, gather around the education of our youngest and vote no on the Cresha motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, um, and, and we've heard some of the back and forth here again, uh, very similar to the bill yesterday. It seems that uh, some Republicans and Democrats are, are, are uh, racing to bring forward uh, more spending in a variety of areas. This time it's education members. There's $1.3 billion in federal money that's going to be hitting the state of Minnesota here very shortly, going to schools, going to schools for them to use on summer school or uh, any program that they want to. So why are we in a race to bring forward even more taxpayer money? Um, again, a very political, situation here. I, I guess Mr. Speaker, I, point of order. I don't want to get called off for motives again. Uh, Representative Dreskowski is questioning motives of members. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind members not to question the motives of other members. Thank you. Uh, Representative well, Mr. Dreskowski. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there's not a need for this bill. The federal government is providing more than enough money for school districts throughout Minnesota, all 330 of them, to do summer school, to do two summer schools if they want, or do three summer schools. We don't need to encumber more Minnesota taxpayers' money in order to do this, uh, no matter what our motives are to bring this bill forward. Uh, I would encourage a vote against this bill, and I'd encourage a vote against the bill the Democrats are gonna bring next week for the very same reason 
The schools are going to have all the money they need to do pre or do summer school uh, without the legislature getting in the way, creating a structure that tells them what they have to do in order to get money that they would otherwise get uh, that they can spend on their own summer school program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I just wanna uh, add to the comments of uh, Chair Davney to just note uh, that the portion of his bill that he referred to, House File 1064, that relates to, uh, to early learning, uh, early summer learning was heard in the House Early Childhood Committee and was then uh, included in the, uh, in the bill that uh, as Chair Davney referenced passed uh, Ways and Means last night. And in fact, contrary to the comments that were made earlier, um, the portion of this bill in front of us right now, uh, Representative Creech's bill that relates to early learning was in fact brought as an amendment in, uh, in our committee. And I actually think that it was brought as an amendment in education finance. And in fact, we voted down at that point. Um, the fact is that there are, these provisions are moving. Uh, they're gonna be in front of us very shortly. And uh, I would urge members to uh, vote against the motion. Thank you. The representative from St. Louis, Representative Sandstein. Speaker, I'm wondering if Representative Draskowski will yield for a question. Representative Draskowski, would you yield for a question? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. He will yield. Thank you. Representative Draskowski, what school districts have you been in contact with that have asked to uh, not move a, some type of summer school bill forward? What school district has said, let's wait? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Sandsteed, I don't think school districts uh, uh, care about whether there's a bill that passes here or which party passes the bill, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. Uh, I know they don't want structure placed around the money that comes to them. Um, we see in many of these bills and Representative Davney's bill has all kinds of structure in it uh, that directs schools on what they have to do with the money. The schools don't want that. Uh, the school districts that I have talked to, uh, they want to have the flexibility to spend the money that they get on their kids in the way that they can customize most properly and, and most directly and most effectively for the school district without the legislature getting in the way and directing or limiting more of it. Uh, they have $1.3 billion coming. Uh, this bill, if I, maybe Representative Cresha can tell us, but the bill he's talking about, if I remember right, it was about $75 million. Um, the Representative Davney's bill was 104 million, if I remember the number right there. A fraction, a small fraction of the large amount of money that's gonna be coming to school districts across Minnesota. Let's let them use that money unencumbered to form the programs that they need, whether it's summer school or anything else that they need to do without us getting in the way. Thank you, Representative Sandsteed. Thank you, Mr. Representative Sandsted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Representative Draskowski, I'm understanding you to say no school district in the state of Minnesota has come to you and said, please don't move any bill forward because federal money is coming. Is that correct? Are you asking him to yield? Representative Sanstead, are you asking I, Representative Draskowski yes, to yield? I am asking Representative Draskowski to yield. I will yield, Mr. Speaker. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Spe or Mr. Speaker and uh, Representative Sandsteed. Representative Sandsteed, no school district in Minnesota has come to me uh, asking me to pass a bill for summer school. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sandsted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to share with members, many school districts have come to me to say they are concerned about how to address the loss of learning and how they can play catch up with their students which unequivocally includes some form of summer school instruction, um, either in the traditional or non-traditional sense. But for the record, not one school district has a, said to me or to any of my colleagues that I'm aware of, please hold off because federal money is coming, do nothing. And I'm going to ask members to vote their conscience on this bill but we do need to move a bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's, the representative from, Shish from Chicago, Representative New Brindley. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate what Representative Sandstead just said, you know, in asking the question which school districts have, um, have asked that we wait. And I agree, I think probably a lot of us talked to our school administrators this week. I know I talked to mine. And my, the message from my school administrators was very, very clear. We can't wait. We need to know about this funding now. Um, some school districts actually have existing summer school programs that they can, um, that they can augment and amplify and, and they're sort of scalable, they can make that happen. Not every school district has that. There are school districts that are gonna have to stand up a new program. And in order to do that, they need to know that they have those resources available. Um, this is not a bill that we can wait on. Unfortunately, I suspect that my Democrat colleagues today are going to take a vote to wait. I suspect that today they're going to vote no on this motion. And they're going to say, nope, we should wait. So while I appreciate Represent Representative Sandstead's question, and I agree, I haven't talked to a single school district that has asked us to wait. That is what the Democrats are going to do today. They're going to tell us to wait. They're going to tell our school administrators to wait. That's what we've been telling everybody this whole session. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get to it. Just wait. We'll get there. Well, I know my school districts can't wait. Members, I urge your support of the motion. The representative from St. Louis, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will, uh, I just want to share with members that I have a difference of opinion on how this vote would look. Waiting for a week to hear a full perspective on the conversation about the bills presented is not too long of a time for school districts to wait. Not one school district has come to me, and I'm an educator, and I work very closely with my school districts. Not one district has come to me to say, let's only hear one side of the story. And I believe there is a bill that will be coming forth next week that we can hear and we can take a vote on. And I do believe it's in the best interest of all Minnesotans to hear the full conversation and pushing a bill through the floor tonight, taking this issue up tonight without hearing the full conversation, the conversation that represents all of the districts across Minnesota is really reckless and irresponsible. And yes, there is a timeline. I don't disagree with that, but it isn't necessarily today. So let's be honest in saying, let's have the full conversation and we can wait a couple of days to have this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, I'll be quick here. Uh, Representative Sandstead, thanks for the comments. I, I did get a little bit of a mixed message, though. Um, you had asked Representative uh, Dreskowski which one of his school districts had he talked to that asked him to wait. Um, and, uh, and then in your comments, uh, I'm pretty sure you argued that we should wait. Um, so I think we, we did receive a little bit of a mixed message there. But I just have one question, if she would yield. Representative. Sandstead, would you yield for a question? I will yield. She will yield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Sandstead. If you could just answer for me which one of your school districts you talked to that asked you to wait. Representative Sandstead. I have several school districts that have asked me to provide a bill that is comprehensive, that includes the needs they need addressed, and there are several. If you'd like me to name them by name, I'm happy to do so. But what we are not hearing tonight is a comprehensive overlook of options available to school districts. I have not had a school district that said to me, quick, take the first option available. Representative Dowd. Thank you. The prosecution rests, Your Honor. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Y you know, I'm touring one of my schools tomorrow, and I really am looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to it f for a long time. And I'm, I'm so frustrated by this whole debate we've had today. We don't have to keep waiting on PPP, on unemployment 
tax uh, relief. We don't have to wait on this. The Krisha motion provides for this money to be reimbursed when we do get additional federal um, money through the American Rescue Plan. Schools need to plan now. I remember being stunned. I actually got two phone calls. Back in February, when the governor first announced his budget, he said, well, pretty soon we'll start worrying about, um, we'll, we'll make more announcements so that people can start planning their weddings in June. And my phone lit up from photographers, from wedding venues, from brides saying, what is he talking about? We have to start planning now. And the schools need to start planning now. This is a very comprehensive bill. 75 million for summer schools, um, 6 million for school linked mental health, 9 million for um, equity distribution, summer transportation, early learning scholarships, um, additional appropriations. Members, this is very comprehensive. And if we forget something, we can still add that at the bill that Representative Sandsteed is talking about next week. But let's get this done now. I just, I don't know why we're waiting on all these important things that we have bipartisan agreement on and that Minnesotans want us to get done. My email is full with people who want the PPP and the unemployment for get, uh, tax relief. We're not doing that today. Now we're postponing getting this aid out to schools. Schools have to plan for summer school. They have to know that they have this funding available. Please members, let's vote for this. If there's additional things we need to add, it can be done in the future, but let's get this much done now. Thank you. The representative from Polk, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, for this opportunity. I um, want to share with you that I met with um, more than my district, uh, at least District 1, 2, maybe even um, uh, four uh, superintendents, all the superintendents in our school districts in the area. And I had a wonderful conversation with them. But as a former uh, school board uh, member, uh, they, we talked about their nervousness about being able to plan or not plan for school summer school, uh, the intent of what they need to be doing uh, even in the fall. They are very concerned about how long this is taking. And it is really, really important that we make those decisions as so sooner than later. School boards are meeting. Um, they need to have decisions made. They need to know what they can look for. And, um, and the teachers that may or may not be available in summer uh, uh, education to be even there to teach students. So I would urge uh, the members to support this bill. As uh, Representative Robbins said, there are more things that we need to discuss with school, but um, I, I, it's just so important that the school board and the uh, superintendents know what they can plan for. And the sooner we get this done, the better. Uh, it would really, really encourage us as members to uh, address this for our districts because our children are really in need of um, some strengthening of the education and, and uh, helping those leaders to provide that direction is a very important. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Wright, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I was very curious to hear the, the different uh, sides on this. I was intently listening to those that are advocating for passage of this. I was uh, intently listening to those such as Representative Dabney speak against this. But then I got very confused. I'm glad I wasn't the only one. I thought maybe it was just me, but then I heard Representative Doubt. Uh, so I heard those that were for it, those that are against it. And then I heard somebody who was for it before she was against it within just a few minutes. And I'm just very confused. Uh, I don't know, as I'm listening to the, the different different people here with their opinions, um, I thought that I was leaning one direction, but then again, Representative Sandsteed confused me by being for it before she was against it, apparently. So I am thank you that I'm not the only one who is uh, having this mixed message here. Thank you. The representative from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, uh, just to clarify things, we will be taking up a school uh, summer learning bill on Tuesday. I would ask members to vote no on the suspension of the rules that's in front of us so that we can allow the regular order of the House of Representatives to be how we pass legislation. Please vote no.
Mr. Speaker. Yes, please identify yourself. Representative Krisha, I just didn't know if yep. you were going to allow the author of the motion to close. Yes, of course, Representative Krisha, uh, you're uh, you're up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I, I I didn't purposely go into the details because it was the motion that was the most important piece that was in front of us. Um, I we could have had that robust discussion. If this passes, we can go into the the depths of this. We can go into the the details of the bill if that happens. But I, I am going to take a step back for a moment. And there were some comments here that were, frankly, uh, I, I, will, I won't agree with them. Um, to suggest that using a legitimate rule of the House and the tools that we have available, which is to bring up a motion, is reckless and irresponsible is just wrong. In the minority, you have some tools to you. In the majority, you have the votes. You have the gavels, you have the rostrum, you have the committee chairs, and your only other responsibility is to respect the voice of the minority. You can run this place however you want, but it is still a place of debate. It is still a place where we bring up ideas and you can squash them at your desire anytime you would like. But to simply disregard the legitimate voices of minority members who also have election certificates and who also represent districts is unfortunate. Using a legitimate tool of the House, which is simply to bring up a motion, is nothing more than using the tools that are available. And by disregarding the voice, and, and that continually happens, the majority party, your only job is to give us our voice. You can take anything else at a whim, but to take that voice away and it's so re repeatedly done so that we can't even get to a robust discussion is simply just a level that, that I, I find appalling. I don't, I don't care if people wanna vote for or against the bill. I don't care if you wanna vote for or against the motion but at least allow the members to do what they came here for. And that is to express the viewpoints they've heard from their constituents, to allow them to do their job without feeling like things are happening irresponsibly or recklessly. The only thing we do here is debate and vote. And when those simple things become castigated as oh my gosh, we're doing it wrong, we're doing it in, in this way that's, that's not correct. Members, we, we've reached a level that's just uh, appalling, frankly. Majority party, you have the votes, you have the gavels, you have the rostrum, do whatever you would like. But stop squashing the voice. Vote us down, I don't care. So members, I, I'd happily hope you would support this motion so we could get to a more robust discussion, but do so in a respectful manner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no more discussion to the Cresha motion, the clerk will take the roll. Okay. Hang on one second. Remember, those, those that are voting remotely, please vote. Uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members that have not voted yet? Anderson. Anderson, I. 
Anderson, aye. Bennett. Bennett, aye. Bennett, aye. Berg. Berg, no. Berg, no. Bernardi. Bernardi, no. Bernardi, no. Bull. Bo, aye. Bo, aye. Bolden. Bolden, no. Bolden, no. Davids. Davids, aye. Davids, aye. Erickson. Uh, Erickson, aye. Erickson, aye. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, aye. Grunhagen, aye. Hamilton. Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, aye. Hassan. Hassan. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Hollins. Hollins, no. Hollins, no. Johnson. Johnson, I. Johnson, I. Katiza Watoon. Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. Nash. Nash, I. Nash, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Pryor. Pryor, no. Pryor, no. Sandell. Sandell, no. Sandell, no. Schumacher. Schumacher, I. Schumacher, I. Sundin. Sundin. Swazinski. Swazinski, I. Swazinski, I. West. West, I. West, I. Wolgamont. No. Wolgamont, no. Zhang T. Zhang T, no. Zhang T, no. Joachim. Joachim, yes. No, Joachim, no. Joachim, no. Hassan. Uh, no. Hassan, no. Sandin, no. Sandin, no. The clerk will close the roll. With 56 ayes and 76 noes, the motion does not prevail. Announcements. Mr. Speaker. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Sp Representative McDonald, where'd you go? Yes, you thank muted. you. Thank you, Mr. There Chair. You are. Yes. Did you hear anything I said? We did not. Please start from the beginning. I will. Like I said yesterday, I will keep it short and say it well. Uh, I rise to honor Roger Tipka of Litchfield, Minnesota on his 100th birthday. As communities are blessed by the presence of those who have long lived lives and who are part of our living history and having 100th birthday, is a very joyous occasion and a time to honor and congratulate the celebrant. Roger Tipka was born on March 17, 1921 to parents Fred and Maria Tipka in Litchfield, Minnesota. As one of eight siblings, Roger has lived in Litchfield for his entire life except for the time that he served in the service. Roger has been married to Doris Ziska Tipka for 72 years and together they have four children, seven grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. During World War II, Roger served the United States Army C Company 568 Signal Aircraft Warning Battalion as a radio operator from 1942 to 1945. While serving in the Army, Roger was stationed on Iwo Jima and witnessed both the first and second raisings of the flag in 1945. Pretty cool accomplishment to be there. After his service, Roger worked as a mechanic for Kavan Motors, then known as Fenton Motors, and most recently as Davis Motors, ending his 75 career at the ripe old age of 99. Incidentally, Adolf Kavan served in this House of Representatives from 1967 to 1987. Roger was known as the cookie guy in his last position at the dealership, 
and he was in the waiting room offering cookies and coffee to customers waiting for their service, their cars to be serviced. Roger has been a member of the St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Litchfield in Minnesota for over 72 years. Whereas uh, after 69 years in the same home, Roger and Doris recently moved to Ekman Lich of Litchfield. Roger will celebrate or did celebrate yesterday his 100th birthday. So be it resolved the Committee of Rules and Legislative Administration in the House of Minnesota and the House of Representatives in the state of Minnesota that we wish to extend our deepest gratitude and acknowledgement of Roger Tipka on the service of his country, community, and residents, dated March 17, 2021. So I just wish Roger a very happy birthday on behalf of the on behalf of the Minnesota House of Representatives and thank Janet Forstrom and uh, for giving me all the great information on Roger. So if we take an opportunity to clap virtually and in the house and honor Roger Tipka. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative McDonald and uh, happy birthday, Roger. Announcements. Here, here. Other announcements. Mr. Chair. Yes, please identify yourself. Representative Donald Raleigh. Representative Raleigh. Uh, Mr. Chair, I rise for a House resolution as well uh, in the line of uh, what Representative McDonald just uh, was able to put forth. And this is you for Steve Lee, if I may, Mr. Chair. Steve Lee was a pillar of the community in Circle Pines, Minnesota. And he was a public servant at heart serving as a longtime volunteer firefighter with the Centennial Fire District, working as a teacher before starting his career at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in 1978. He was passionate about serving Minnesotans and had a specific interest in tackling spill and emergency response. He helped start the innovative environmental cleanup programs such as the Minnesota Superfund, the Hazardous Waste Strike Force, the Household Hazardous Waste Program, and the Emergency Response Program. Steve served as an emergency response manager before he retired from the MPCA in 2015. He was known at the MPCA as a gracious and soft-spoken man who invested in people in ways that allowed them to shine. And Steve was known in Circle Pines as a local storyteller and a historian, authoring a fascinating book on the history of Circle Pines from the 1800s to the year 2000. He was recently awarded the Mayor's Award for Community Leadership and Recognition for his many contributions to our community of Circle Pines. Sadly, Mr. Lee passed away on Sunday, February 28th, leaving behind a loving family and a local legacy. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Committee of Rules and Legislative Administration of the House of, of Re Representatives of the State of Minnesota that it honors the life of Steve Lee and extends its deepest condolences to his family and all that knew him. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Representative Winkler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, an announcement. Uh, we have heard two memorials on, on the floor, two celebrations, and those are not announcements. Members, please uh, seek recognition and permission from the speaker before bringing items of personal interest to the floor. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, speaker, I move that when the Mr. House speaker, adjourns today, speaker, it adjourns until 3.30 p.m. Monday, speaker, March 22nd, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I wish to speak. Mr. Speaker, please. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns at 3.30 p.m. Monday, March 22nd, 2021. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say aye. no. Aye. aye. No. 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 Motion prevails. Representative Just Winkler. Mr. Speaker, I move I that the House do now adjourn. Representative Winkler moves that the aye. House do now adjourn. Aye. All those in favor aye. say aye. Aye. All those opposed aye. say no. Aye. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 3.30 p.m. Monday, March 22nd, 2021.